Okay. It is 7.15. So we're gonna come back from our break. Yeah, we're good. Timing is perfect. 6.30. On the dot. Oh, look at me. <laughs> Ten minutes before I saw the clock. Yeah, Whew, I was a little late. Yeah, that's right. It's a Don't record for work, work this week. Yeah, mayor and the president were out. Yeah. Okay, so we are back from our break, and we are going to um, start with um, some potential changes to the zoning. Yes. So I am Mike Miller. I'm the planning director for the city, and so we had a brief introduction to this. <laughs> two meetings ago on what are the zoning fixes. So in 2018, we went through and passed new zoning for the city, and we realized soon after that we had a couple of small and some larger issues that had kind of come up. And so the staff assembled a repair list of about 100 changes that needed to go through, but there were two sections that were of particular interest that really impacted projects and a number of potential projects that could happen. And so we wanted to kind of expedite an interim change, an emergency zoning change that would just go through and address two issues, uh, steep slopes and landscaping and screening requirements. So um, what you have before you tonight for consideration, this is a public hearing, so we will take public comment, um, is to review the, the strikeout copy changes for section 3007 and 3203. And um, so that's, these uh, are designed to be interim changes and we will be soon after going through the full adoption process to include those two sets of changes with the other 80 or so sets of changes. Um, so, this uh, only requires one hearing, so the council does have the option, if they chose tonight, to adopt the interim changes, or we can have another public hearing. So that, just to give you an idea of the process. Um, last time I kind of went through some of the more detailed pieces. Um, I can give a general update to each of the two sections. It's up to you how much you, information you guys want me to go back over again. Uh, section 3007 is steep slopes, and the issue that came up here was um, we had no regulations impacting steep slopes before 2018. So we did not regulate steep slopes at all. In the 2018 rules that were added, there was a prohibition on development of 30% slopes, which seemed to make sense, except that as we started to use that rule, we noticed they come up in small amounts in a lot of places. And it was impacting a number of projects that we felt um, were good projects, um, driveway <coughs> curb cuts that couldn't be approved, fixing retaining walls that couldn't be approved. So um, we reviewed and went through and made a proposal that you have before you um, that the changes are kind of embedded into figure 3-08 and 3-09 where we revised some of the hearing thresholds and disturbance thresholds for who needs to get permits and when a hearing would be required. But most importantly for this, uh, we removed the prohibition on development for 30% slopes and simply said that all development that affects 30% slopes will require a hearing and all development that requires, or that impacts 30% slopes would require an engineering plan. In that way, the, the purposes of the steep slope section are to make sure that we're protecting public safety and property and we're minimizing the potential for erosion and we felt these two changes would maintain that. I guess I'll so any questions about these potential changes? Uh, Lauren. Um, one question I had had was um, if there was a benefit to adding some indication in the you know, maybe language and one through 14, um, just indicating that the goal is to avoid developing on greater than 30% slopes, just because this goes from a standard of prohibition, which clearly was the policy goal, to allowing it. And there's, there's no language that's indicating that we don't really want you to develop there, but if it's unavoidable and otherwise a good project, you could get approval with a good engineering plan. Whereas this just says, just do an engineering plan and there's no motivation to try to avoid developing. 
steep slope. So I was wondering if you had thought <laughs> or if there was an, an easy way to do that or that just opens a whole can of worms that's not easily resolved. Uh, well, I did, I did think about that after our discussion and a couple other people have made that or some, a comment similar to that. Um, so um, options to limit impact, I kind of came up with three, one of which is kind of a, a wait and see. We could pass these changes and evaluate. We already said there were no regulations before 2017. This 2018 is 100% prohibition, and this is kind of bringing it back a little bit. We can see how that goes. Um, the second option would be to, to cap the amount of development allowed on figure 3-09. So if we were to, for, and these are just example numbers, if we had a, um, you know, disturbance no more than 4,000 square feet um, requires a hearing, then we could say, but at um, development can't be more than 12,000 square feet. So basically put a, an outside boundary on um, what could happen. So, you know, maybe it would be 12,000 square feet is the maximum disturbance at all for 15%, 9,000, 6,000, 3,000. I just multiplied each one of those by three. But you could, there's no, nothing behind that other than just adding some outside boundary. It could be larger, it could be smaller. That's another way of doing it. Um, uh, a third way that I thought of would be to add <coughs> language as you proposed, which might say something like, where other viable locations exist that are less steep on a parcel, the applicant should or shall utilize those locations first to the maximum extent feasible. So that could be some language we could insert. So those were the three kind of potential ways I saw of um, maybe <coughs> addressing those types of concerns. that. Put a boundary. Do you have any further thoughts on that? I mean, do you have a preference? If not, that's fine. Um, I mean, I would probably prefer the last, just in terms of sending a signal that we want to avoid that when you can, um, but you still have a process to go through um, if it's unavoidable, and, and then you could have the whole process to, to weigh. Is it a good project that should be approved? So. What do you what do you think about that, Mike? I mean, if we, because I, I mean, I know these were, um, you know, the planning commission <clears throat> agreed to these changes. If we further modify them, I mean, one one thought. Well, I, I would love to if that's if that's a, a change to what's written here. Um, then you know, I'd love to hear from members of the planning commission see if you agree or think that's fine. Um, and uh, you know, one possibility, actually one of the things that I could use actually a little bit of clarity on mm -hmm. um, is uh, were you hoping that we open a public hearing tonight on this? Yes, it okay. is a warrant public hearing. A warrant public hearing. So, um, so when we have this public hearing, um, we could also be uh, adopting these tonight as, a, as interim um, zoning bylaws. Yes. And then, um, what's the pro can you explain again the process of like how we move from um, these being interim to um, fully adopted? So the Planning Commission has already started their warning process for the permanent adoption. Mm -hmm. Their first hearing will be April, what do we want to say? 8th. <clears throat> so April 8th will be the Planning Commission's first public hearing where they'll take testimony on all the changes, um, most of which are relatively minor these are the, the bigger ones um, and then they would they could at that time move it forward assuming they don't need to make other changes but they could then move that when they're ready they will make a motion to move it to City Council for your mm -hmm. consideration you guys have to have at least two public hearings mm -hmm. um, those need 30 days notice so as we start adding these timelines out it may be May or June my hope is to have this all wrapped up by the end of June and I recall that you know there's something about there's this overlap time you know that there's a, a certain amount of time during which both sets of bylaws apply um, yes. and it does that apply to the interim um, 
It doesn't apply it doesn't, to the okay. increment. It applies okay. to the permanent adoption. Okay, the great. Thank order. you. Yeah. Um, so if we could go back to a sec for a second to Lauren. So what was it that, you, can you just reiterate what you had hoped the, the change might be? Well, I, I think the, the language that Mike proposed to, to add something in, um, in the language, I think somewhere in 1 to 14, indicating that, you know, to the extent that the project can avoid the steep slopes, um, if feasible, that you would, that the project would, would do so. And otherwise, you would trigger this engineering plan and then could go through the process. Mm -hmm. um, fair enough. Thoughts from the Planning Commission on that? Hi, I'm Kirby Keaton. I'm here to represent the Planning Commission. And this, as Mike mentioned, this is something we discussed. And uh, we didn't end up voting on it, but it was, it was something we did discuss. Uh, so, so we've already thought about it. What comes to my mind is, so for, for the steeper slopes, we'll be adhering. And we want to make sure the DRB has something that it can apply, like some kind of standard. Feasible seems pretty strict to me. So <laughs> the Planning Commission may want to talk about, because a lot of things are feasible, so we st it's, it still might be desirable to allow development that, uh, that impacts the slope that, you know, maybe doesn't meet a feasible threshold, or maybe it could be done theoretically somewhere else, but, so, so, so it, we, it may be worth it for us to talk about a standard that's, that can apply, and, and, but I do understand what you're getting at, because we have the same thoughts. We'll actually, we'll be discussing later some other um, uh, discussions we've had, and some other suggestions we have concerning steep slopes, where this also is a factor where we want to make sure, like we want to allow some more things with steep slopes, so just to give you a, a heads up about that. Where this will also, it'll help that we have a standard for this, I think, so when that comes up. Would that be okay if we yes. think about it? Yes. So th that would be the, the kind of thing that you would continue to discuss and come back to us later with um, some potentially different language, but yeah, not at this I'm point. we would add a subdivision 15 that mm -hmm. adds some kind of standard that the DRB could apply to hearing. Does that make sense to you, Mike? Yeah, I, and I think you're right. It, it, there is the challenge with the way this is worded, because something could be a better project might be closer to the road that'll have a minor impact on a steep slope that can be easily engineered and protected against erosion, but because they have farther back in their parcel a you know, a flatter spot that they could put the property with a longer driveway, it may not be as good of a project, but it would avoid that small impact on the steep right. slope. Fair enough. Does that, does that satisfy you, Lauren? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kirby. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Jack, and then I want to make sure, I, actually, before you go, Jack, I want to make sure that I don't forget, um, we're gonna, I'm going to officially open the public hearing, so um, we'll take public comments in a minute. Yes. I just noticed uh, a technical change that we should put in, in uh, section 3.2037A. There's uh, a point where the phrase, uh, they, Minimus appears, and it should be de minimis. So it should be IS rather than US. Okay. From the legal maxim de minimis non curat lex. Okay. Which means I'm, the law I'm does not you. concern itself with <laughs> trifles. I'll have to see which number seven you can you can you say three, the, uh, 3. the number again? Three point two zero three seven A. What's what's the letter that's after it? Three two zero three point. Uh, let me see. Let me, uh, I. Oh. I got it. Three point two zero three I. It's actually in there twice, but in the original it was misspelled as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I get. I'm gonna assume that's not a big deal. I will, I will just make a note that it, to That's an amenable change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. friendly, friendly amendment there. Fix. Further questions? <coughs> All right, any comments from the public? Hello, my name is Will Shabow. Uh, I live here in Montpelier. I'm a contractor and also a member of the Development Review Board. And uh, as somebody who works daily, interacting with the 
planning and zoning department and also on projects that you know range from flat fields to slopes um, <coughs> this I uh, definitely encourage the adoption of these interim zoning changes um, it's, we've got multiple projects kind of on hold waiting you know whether it's first it's one of them's a small addition single family household you know nothing dramatic not we're not talking condos here um, Whereas a small portion of it, just due to the nature of the lot and the design, like a 50 square foot portion of this addition is tucking into a 30% slope. And uh, the project that basically stalled due to that. And I've also spoken with civil engineers who said we can develop up to 50% slope with no problem. It's doable. So 30% is not very steep, ultimately. Um, the difference between, say, a 28% and a 31% is. Um, most of us would probably not notice that and uh, so as I said I think for practical purposes and just kind of furthering smart infill development uh, I encourage you to adopt these changes thank you, thank you. anyone else sure. yep. Hello, my name is Michael Howard, uh, on the part of North Street, and I too would encourage you to uh, adopt the uh, proposed changes. <coughs> um, the, the stated aim is uh, uh, to protect structures and erosion control can easily be achieved by engineering plans. I'm actually a structural engineer, I know civil engineers. You can design on 100% soil, for sure. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you guys want to do that. <laughs> but, Keep in mind, a 30% slope is actually 15 degrees. It's this, hmm. right? It's not this. <laughs> so I'm looking to do a sort of 700 square foot two car garage addition and renovate the house. Uh, you know, $150,000 in local um, economy, um, not a radical departure. It's an attachment to a house that's already there, and I'm prohib prohibited from doing it. It seems a little excessive, and it seems like it's a cannon trying to kill a fly, is my opinion. So I strongly <laughs> recommend uh, uh, adoption. Further, I'd say there's the way the stat, the way the regulation is written, talks about um, safety and runoff. But what I'm hearing here is some um, aesthetic concerns and not developing on steep slopes for reasons other than safety. Well, then that should be addressed as such not sort of tucked into a safety issue. So that's okay. two cents. Thank, Thank you. you. Other comments? Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing if no one else has uh, thoughts we, or comments. Do we, did we want to go over the landscaping? I haven't personally received comments on the landscaping. <laughs> um, I just went over the... This. Okay, Look. well, I'm going to keep the public comment period open then. Just, well, let's talk about landscaping. I won't, I don't have to necessarily do, have a big conversation here on the, the landscaping. Um, it's a, you were provided strikeout copies and a clean version. The, the reason, the strikeout copy pretty much is most of it, most everything in red. Um, but the important things were with the landscaping is it, is it was missing a lot of administrative rules. There were no discussions of how we're going to handle grandfathered properties, so existing properties. A lot of the rules that were proposed for 2018 seem as though our consultant were kind of using rules that were designed for new development in a green field, um, as opposed to most of our projects, which are redevelopment. So we really need to have a discussion and have rules that address what do we do when something doesn't meet the existing rules. Um, and those were the things that were missing. Um, we needed some exemptions for certain applications, you know, a change of use inside of a building. Um, there were no exemptions, so those would have to go through a full site plan process. So this was a somewhat um, carefully rewritten um, new set of rules. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of um, comments from the folks that have reviewed it. I haven't had many comments. More people were more interested in the steep slopes than they were with the landscaping, but I can go into more details if you want. Uh, Questions from council? Oh, uh, Jeff. 
I remember the last time we talked about this, one topic that got people's attention was how we would uh, apply, or whether this would be applied and how it would be applied to uh, uh, vehicle sale uh, lots. And I just wanted to throw that open to ask if anyone has had any more thoughts about that, which I really haven't. But. I'm not advocating for any change myself. No. And you haven't heard anything further, Mike, no, about I that? No, okay. I haven't heard anything. That's a rule that ha isn't being proposed for changing. In the zoning we have today, the ones that were passed in 2018, they also had an exemption for parking lot landscaping does not apply to automobile sales lots. So. OK. Fair enough. No further comments? Questions? Okay, uh, any comments from the public on the landscaping? Okay, seeing none, um, I'm going to close the public hearing on that as well. Um, so, Mike, if I'm correct, I think we are probably at the point of potentially having a motion on the interim. Uh, Zoning bylaws. Yes. If the yeah. If uh, commission would anybody desire, desire indeed would anybody like to make a motion? I, I can make the motion that we adopt the interim zoning amendment. The planning commission recommends for section three o o seven and thirty two o three. Second. Further comments. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Planning Commission for all your work and Mike. Um, sounds like this is going to be uh, a much needed fix. So. Can I ask for a clarification on what was, was there the change added that oh. Lauren? Oh, no, I think the, that's being with, I think, Kirby help. said they were. Yes, so that's, we'll that's not. We'll take it up not, on the permanent. Um, right? Okay. Is it, it understanding that we are, you know, we're changing um, the, the misspelling there? Right, that's well, Jack's, Jack's yeah, that's, amendment? Okay, we're going to assume that that's fine. Okay. okay, no, I just wanted to make sure when I go back to the Planning Commission, that's what their task is. Okay, that. super. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. It's got to be a record for the fastest that's zoning. <laughs> <laughs> Don't push it. <laughs> we have another one. Well, was, you know, right. some limited <laughs> topics. That's fine. All right, so on to the audit report. Well, welcome. I'll uh, let you introduce yourselves. Good evening, everyone. My name is Todd Preventer. I'm the finance director for the city of Montpelier. This is Heather Graves, uh, staff accountant in the Department of the Clerk's Office. Senior accountant, Ruth Doctor, our current true workhorse of this process. And Teresa Kajinski, CPA for Finding the City Allen Valley um, right here in town. Um, we don't have any formal proposal process. Each of you received a digital version of the uh, audit report. I have hard copies as well. Um, if anyone wants one, just let me know. Uh, okay. I can hand <coughs> one out to everybody. Some people don't use the hard copies, other people are hands. Um, so other than that, uh, just keep it brief. Actually, I'll let Teresa keep it brief. Sure. Um, <laughs> She's really reporting on us. I, so, um, I, uh, in the electronic copy or the paper copy going around, there's um, a loose piece of paper that is uh, the governance letter of the audit. And this is something that is um, to address to the city council from Father Gill, Chevalier, and Valley. Um, and I'm just going to go over a little bit of that and then talk about just a couple of highlights in the audit because this is a, a June 30, 2018 audit and 
almost April 1st. So these are uh, old numbers. Um, but uh, still, the audit needs to get done, and there's certain uh, just some things that I wanted to go over with you guys. Um, so one of the things that happens in the audit that we like to discuss is there are certain estimates that have to be done. Um, and uh, the ones that, that we feel that are sensitive are um, estimate of the useful life of the capital assets, all the assets that the, the city owns, which is a lot and has. Um, uh, so uh, we just like to say that that's just an estimate. Um, we don't know how long they're actually going to last. Um, the other uh, estimate in there is the amount of um, <coughs> doubtful accounts that you might not receive certain um, receivables, whether it's tax receivables, um, note receivables. There's a lot of uh, notes in the, in the community development fund that you know are 30-year notes that have been loaned to various places. Um, and various people. So we just, you know, there's an allowance for those not being collected again. That is an estimate. Um, we didn't um, encounter any significant difficulties with the audit. We uh, got through everything. We have a lot of help from the city. Um, and everything we asked for was provided to us. Um, uh, when you perform an audit, there's sometimes things that, that don't get booked because they're not material and these need to be uh, ad addressed and so you guys understand what those are and there's uh, two things that happen. Um, one, uh, a prior year receivable for the local app options tax was missed on June 30, 17's audit. Um, that was money that was received in probably September of two, September. yeah, August or September <coughs> of 2017. That was actually for the previous year, and the other, uh, and so instead of booking a prior period adjustment, it wasn't a material amount. I don't remember the exact amount of it, but I think it was fifty thousand. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's not material to to these numbers. And the other um, item that wasn't adjusted was way back with a, something to do with depreciation on a capital asset. And, and that's coming down to almost not having to even discuss that every year, like we have been for four years. Um, uh, we, we proposed uh, no audit adjustments. Um, we work uh, with Ruth uh, during this whole process, and she, what did you say? Yeah, so good, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of things that kind of get discovered aren't really audit adjustments. It's usually stuff she's <coughs> discovering while she's closing the books, and we might still be here auditing, so uh, we didn't have any of those. So that's good. That's good. Um, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to just note is that we didn't we performed a, a single audit, it, which is based on um, the city of Montpelier receives more than seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars of federal dollars, and when that happens, you're required to have um, an audit, and it's called a single audit, and there's certain compliance requirements that need to be done, and we had no findings. Um, the major program was related to the Northfield Street project. Um, which the state monitors very heavily, but there was no, we found no findings with that. Um, the other part is uh, the financial audit is an unqualified opinion, meaning we didn't, nothing was qualified that wasn't in accordance with uh, governmental staff. Um, so with that, I can talk about all the numbers in here. Uh, you, these are, like I said, this is definitely historical. Uh, if you want, we can, I can go over some of them or you can ask me questions. Um, one thing that I did want to know is the general fund, um, unassigned fund balance was about 610000 I think that's on track of where you guys want to be. Um, and the other highlight is that the, um, the water fund decreased its deficit during the year by about 200,000, which is 
in the right direction. And so those, those two items came to my attention when I looked back through the audit today. Mm -hmm. before I came in. Mm -hmm. but, uh, again, you guys are budgeting for, I don't know, 2000 for me. And, you know, and 19 is almost done with it. So that's the big stuff that I have. If there's anything, Ruth, that you. So. No. <laughs> The audit report does represent a culmination of a tremendous amount of work. I do have to thank Ruth again uh, this year, and I wasn't expecting to thank her uh, because I was expecting she was going to try to sneak out and uh, stay with us a little bit longer, and we hope to get a little bit more out of her uh, in some capacity. Um, but you know, the, the fact that financially we are moving in the right direction and we didn't have any significant findings has major implications in terms of grant eligibility and other. Um, when we're working with outside entities, federal agencies. So um, that is really good news. And um, I want to thank Ruth and thank Teresa as well for her um, efforts through all of this. And other than that, the bulk of the document is really a cure for insomnia. Um, <laughs> after, after midnight for most people. Uh, government accounting standards focus on improving the functionality of financial statements for making it easier for readers to understand. Uh, I'm not quite sure I subscribe to that, but <laughs> it is a, it's a lot of information. So. Great. I'd just like to thank our staff, too, and, all, of course, Father Gelsigali and Valley. but I think as Teresa will tell you, um, uh, th this is, I don't know how many years now in a row we've had unqualified audits, and that's actually pretty rare for municipalities. So it's, uh, you know, we just kind of get used to it. We hear it every year. It sounds like a term, but actually... We really have done a very good job there. Hats off to all involved. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Um, I'm grateful that we don't have to <laughs> be dealing with anything different. So uh, it's, it's really great. So thank you so much. I and also point out, I'm not saying you have to do this, but um, the audit is really for the elected officials because it's an audit of management. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to, you could go into executive session with Teresa without mm -hmm. staff if you had any questions or any concerns. Okay. That is your option, and it's fully... Okay okay to do so. You want okay. to check backyard, Absolutely. backdoor payments, huh? Okay. <laughs> I'll remember in this that, next year. In that light, you know, I think it has anything to do with Oh, yeah, yeah. It would be in the letter like, anyway. Yeah. If we had that conversation, yeah. she would make that request as well. Super. Any uh, further questions? Yes, uh, Donna. I don't remember you coming this late. Was there a reason? Is it because is it we didn't schedule you? Uh, uh, no, it, it, you know, honestly, uh, uh, kind of a series of Combination, combination um, of comedy of errors, I not mean, errors, but just scheduling stuff too. So um, I had some things come up in my personal yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. Okay. had some no. things come up in her personal life. And it just kind of overlapped. And by the time we had a final report prepared for Teresa, that I think she had these things going well, on. I, they, and they were starting their tax season as well. Yeah. Um, well, every year it gets more complicated. Well, I do know I, that. It does, but I, just, but I do know what happened. The original field work date, what happened is the... There was a hold up with the Northfield Street and the allocation of yeah. the loan. There was that a was whole, a big thing. So yeah. when we have to reschedule a whole week of time, yes, it, it like, it's like a month out. Before. We've got you scheduled now already, right? Uh, <laughs> you guys are going out to bid um, <laughs> this year because you have a, the new tip, right? Yes, yes, so, yes, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, nobody's yeah. got we, we may see you, but <laughs> whoever it is, it's yes. just it helps to have it just a more a little more timely because we are we've been buried in 2019, oh, yeah. 2020, right, 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 right. and now we've, we're really looking at. I mean, I, usually, it's, usually it's January. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, usually yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. And it's um, it's also it's just from a staff yeah. perspective, it, it's a little bit difficult because the bulk of my time is consumed by the budget process during. Process, so we have a, we're building the budget for the next year while we're trying to wrap up. Absolutely, the, yep. Yeah, basically, it's, basically, it's one person with, and I'm, I've been trying to train Heather too, which takes extra time, you know, because I'm retiring. I don't know. Some people know that. You um, said that last year. <laughs> I know. I was supposed to be gone by now. <laughs> well, we're glad you're still here. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> I mean, basically, it's a lot of work for one person, hmm. which is me, <laughs> you know. And I'm trying to, I've been trying to train Heather as much as I can too. For when I'm gone, 
Um, plus, I had I've been having back issues, and I, I don't know a little bit of health stuff in there. Mm -hmm. You know, it just. Yeah. And one of the things that we're contemplating since we are going up to bid, that's a, we're required <coughs> to go up to bid yep. um, every so many years, is contemplating whether we do the financial statements in the house because that is a big chunk of work um, that falls back on the staff internally and whether it makes more sense to have the um, whatever audit firm it is actually prepared for the documents. Right now, the bulk of the financial statement preparation falls on I do. Uh -huh. and then Because I can. Teresa's firm is reviewing everything yeah. and, and taking and tying and checking it. Um, so, so if we spend more money, you can get the... <laughs> I hear the money yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and with TIF that's another element to the audit process for next um, year yes <laughs> okay well there's no action that we need to take should, should um, move to accept the audit oh okay oh. thank you um, so moved. second further discussion uh, all in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed all right, thank you so much you. for all of your work. Okay. Todd. Hey, Todd. Okay, you can have mine back. You ready at all? Oh, you don't want to give it to her? <laughs> there we go. You want to come here? No, that's okay. I just, you know, sometimes it might be useful for you to have hard copies to give out right. to people. Yeah, the, the PDFs are becoming more and more oh, okay. desirable because they're easier to <laughs> people just to search through and find the information. That yep. Thanks. Okay, next up we have a tax stabilization uh, request. So uh, with the Connor brothers, welcome. And as Fred comes up, I thought I'd tee this off a little bit. Um, those of you who remember, we did, um, Mr. Connor appeared before us last year for this project and was approved for tax stabilization with the option to come back once he could, if, if he could secure the uh, appropriate number of employees for the building that met our standard. Um, I know there are some people who have questions about the tax stabilization policy, and I'll just note that it's actually on our next agenda. Um, so this, I would Why urge that, I, <laughs> so I would say if we have policy issues about the policy itself, um, just remind, you know, we will be going to, into that into great detail. Um, so if we could focus on the application of hand, and I really, I feel that it meets the standard and that, um, that it meets the spirit that we, it was approved last year with that provision to come back. So I certainly want to recommend approval, but uh, have at it. Um, Fred, would you like to explain uh, sort of the development since the last time you were here? Sure. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come forward. Could you pull the um, microphone up to you? My brother's Fred, not pleased to report. Can you, uh, yeah. could you uh, just pull that mic just closer to you? Thank you so much. Uh, my brothers and I are pre pleased to report that we have uh, secured Central Vermont Medical Center as a tenant for our new building at One Home Farm Way uh, as a combination of uh, their epic uh, healthcare uh, inf inf uh, IT infrastructure that's being done uh, throughout the UVM health network, uh, as well as other administrative operations. Um, so we, and we have a letter from the hospital uh, in support of this uh, le of level four um, funding. So we're pleased to be adding to the grant list and pleased to be bringing more jobs to the city. Great. Any uh, questions or comments for Fred? Um, Ashley. So um, I was looking at the uh, revised application, because I know you were here last year, at some point last year, don't remember when. Um, so I saw a range of $30,000 per year to $100,000 per year, and I was curious what the numbers were in terms of how many jobs are going to pay on the low end and how many jobs are going to pay the 100000 I don't have any of those numbers. I just uh, asked for a range, and that was, that's what I was given. I would just I would just highlight for everyone on the council that a, the salary of thirty thousand dollars after taxes is a, a, around two thousand dollars a month, and I I am not aware of a, a really realistically how somebody could could afford to live in Montpelier on two thousand dollars a month. I mean, rent alone in this community is huge, um, and, and so I, uh, I I would like to see what that breakdown looks like understanding that you don't have that information I, I don't know how the rest of the council feels i know i've i've been 
uh, solo on a number of these with my vote, which is fine, but I, I just, I really feel pretty strongly that if tax stabilization is something that the city wants to do, um, there is a way to do it, and uh, I don't know that um, not having the information about what those jobs are, are pragmatically going to pay, um, you know, if it's one job that pays $100,000 a year, well, that's really nice for the person making hundred grand, but for the people who are making $30,000 a year, that's not really doing anything. Um, you know, for them, and it's probably actually making life a lot harder working for thirty thousand dollars a year because you got the benefits cliff, and then you're gonna be dealing with how do I access health care, even though you might work for CVMC. You know, I'm gonna have to pay for health care, I have to pay for child care, I have to do all of these life things that thirty thousand dollars a year ain't gonna cover in this area. So, um, Jack, I agree. The criterion is tw at least twenty five new livable wage jobs, and uh, I don't think we have enough information to make that determination yet. I, I and I know you're negotiating with uh, with CVH, but uh, I would be more comfort comfortable voting to approve this. And I, if if we can show well, how many jobs, what what the breakdown is, how many jobs really are paying what we would consider a livable wage. Yeah. I consider the request meddlesome. Um, uh, you have a, you have a policy. We meet it to the letter, and and we're back saying we've got good news. We're adding to the grand list, and we're delivering these jobs, and and that's what the policy says. So, I, I don't have the ability, and, and I think it's a little bit of a privacy issue. For they're not they're not going to obviously give you names. They're, they're probably not going to give you positions. So, um, I was asked for a range. I don't know whether there's one at thirty thousand and one at a hundred, or whether it's you know the median is something different. Mm -hmm. I know they pay very well as far as benefits go. Um, so, yeah, I, I know it's a. I think they're a good employer, but uh, I do think that the criterion includes a determination that it's their jobs at the livable wage. And, and thirty thousand, I believe, meets that meets that requirement. Yeah, I was just looking. Uh, we checked the minimum, the livable wage, at least as of twenty eighteen, was considered thirteen thirty four. And I'm not saying that is it, but that's what the state says is a livable wage. Hey, Which again? Thirteen dollars and thirty-four cents. So that's about just, twenty-seven thousand a year. I I appreciate I, that's what the state says, but mm -hmm. as someone who's actually worked for minimum wage in Vermont when I first came <laughs> here, I, and the, the the national studies where they've broken down cost of living, infrastructure needs, transportation, all of that, it's I think for Montpelier it's around twenty-two dollars an hour in terms of just being able to support a household here. So I, I just, I, I know that's what the state says. I have issues with what the state says is a livable wage because I'm pretty sure the people who are making that living, that, that what they call a livable wage probably aren't working for that. I, um, I would respect so. that. Yeah, the policy doesn't say that the employees are residents of the city. It just says the jobs are located within the city. But if they're getting Montpelier taxpayer money, which in essence they are, in terms of a tax abatement, I, I do think that that's, that's passing that on to Montpelier residents. And I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, it says creating new jobs, but we're, we're in essence asking the, the Montpelier taxpayers to be funding infrastructure upgrades and developments and... You know, I, I think that people who are who are going to be taking these jobs should have the option to live in Montpelier if they want to, and if and if they're not making enough to to do that, I I don't think it's a it's so, it's definitely not so, something I um, support. I'm gonna jump in um, and say it sounds like there are two um, issues that you're raising, Ashley, that I feel like are worth raising in our discussion next time um, about the policy. One is, do we want to have any thoughts on, um, you know, um, residency? Uh, I don't know that we can do anything about that even so, um, but then also, like, whose livable wage do we go by? Um, and so that's, that's something that we can right. discuss next time. Yeah, I so think. I was actually where I was going. Actually, the, what our policy says is that it will result in net increase of 25 full-time equivalent jobs with pay at least a livable wage for a single person as calculated by the State of Vermont Joint Fiscal Office throughout the life of the contract. And the livable wage for a single person is 1334 
which would be 27,000. So when we got the range, we didn't ask any other questions because it met the standard in the policy. And I think you're right. If we want to change that standard in our policy for future applications, that's certainly within the purview of the council. But it was not. It's not the policy <coughs> currently in place, or what was in place when this and I would, was I would, made. I would add, I'm not required to furnish any additional information, but we're talking about double the 25 number. The, the, mm -hmm. we, you're at, you ask us for a statement of 25 or more, which is what we've given you. We're talking about uh, in the range of 50 oh. jobs. Um, I just want to uh, check over here before yeah. we go back, uh, Glenn. Um, Thank you. Uh, I I want to say a few things, and I'm going to try to say them in a, in a reasonable order. First, um, I make about thirty thousand dollars a year, um, and uh, that's pr as part of a dual income family uh, in Montpelier. So I can't say that it's a, a perfect data point. Um, I think that uh, jobs at $30,000 a year are a benefit to Montpelier. It would be great if they were more than that, but I do think that it's a benefit. Second, um, that said, I really do sympathize with Ashley's point that, um, that we should try to do better. And with Jack's point that it seems possible at least to, at least to just get a number of how many jobs at X salary versus how many jobs at another salary. That would also, I agree with Jack that that would make my decision easier. And third, um, I agree, you've, you've met uh, all of the requirements that you've been asked for, and I really do appreciate that. I think that, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think that the council, uh, regardless of whether the, the, the requirements are met, can choose to approve or not in any case. That's not to say that I would choose to disapprove it, but um, I think that that's at our discretion. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. It says, um, and the number of years, is that also at our discretion? Yes. It's up to 10. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm really excited this project is happening, and I, I'm um, I'm you know, grateful for, for your, all uh, for the, your contribution to uh, you know, increasing the grand list and um, helping the city thrive. So um, I, I'm excited to approve this and, and also to have a conversation about uh, you know, how, how does this consul, council want to frame a tax stabilization policy and let's make it um, something that we feel really good about and, and, uh, and would support um, over time. So that's a future conversation. And um, anyway, so I would... Uh, Love to. I'd just like to add that th yeah. this is the fifth investment in the city that my brothers and I have made uh, yeah. over the last 20 years, uh, constituting a, a lot of employees, and uh, we we just firmly believe that we're playing by the rules. And I think if I jump in your if I jump on uh, across the, uh, the the other side of the table, uh, <laughs> it's whether you want to be say that you're open for business or not. We've got another job going on simultaneously right now on the Barry Montpelier Road that we're not seeking tax stabilization for. Uh, which is a project of similar scale to this one. And so we're out there doing what your council goals tell people to do. So I'm asking for an up or down vote tonight. I need to vote tonight because I believe I'm up against my one year deadline, coincidentally. Yeah, fair so enough. I'm, I'm asking for your support. We, th we, think we, we think we do what your council goals tell folks to do, encourage folks to do. Is there a, well, any further discussion or? Uh, oh yeah, sorry, right, Jack. Yeah, I. I don't think that the thirteen thirty four is a reasonable standard, but I do think that uh, it is what our policy our policy ties it to the state's uh, standard, and I uh, I think since we're operating under the current policy, I don't feel that I can say uh, vote to disapprove it i i do think uh, as we uh, examine the tax stabilization policy we should be looking for uh, something more ambitious than that lauren yeah yeah i would just echo i'm excited to dig in on how we could um, potentially improve the um, the criteria in the future and you know looking at this through the lens of what the current 
draft uh, proposal is. Great. That's what I'll do for tonight, but I'm really interested in that discussion cool. and a lot of the issues raised by fellow counselors. Next, next time. Further questions, comments? Okay, so Donna. I'll make a motion that we authorize, uh, we approve the tax stabilization award to Connor Brothers. Mont actually, you're, actually you're amending the one that you awarded last year. Okay, excuse me. The, to amend the April 2018 tax stabilization award to Connor Brothers at the Montpelier Armory LLC to level four tax stabilization benefit, 50%. <laughs> it's the years that I have trouble with. <laughs> I'd say 50% for five years. We already have 50% for seven. I thought this was an increase. Of From seven to 10. Okay, okay. I just thought it was three more years. Great. Okay, 50% for 10 years. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Is there a second? Okay. Further discussion? I. Yep. Fashion. Again, I'm going to be that trope, and I'm okay with it, <laughs> but residents don't get to come to us and ask for a tax abatement like this. And um, I appreciate what you're doing. I think what you're doing is important, and I think that there are ways that, as a city, Montpelier can support you in that endeavor. I don't think that it's through tax policies that, in essence, abate half of the property taxes when residents here are struggling and, you know, when property taxes go up, rent goes up, and we all talk a whole good game about what it means to, you know, make a city where everyone can be. And, you know, we've had residents come to the council when, when we were talking about a nuisance ordinance who, who were very candid and vulnerable and put themselves out there and said, we can't afford to fix our property, um, you know, they're, they're still responsible for taxes on it. And, you know, we struggled as a council to, you know, figure out a budget. And the increase, I think, was more than, I know what you said you were comfortable with, Mayor Watson. Um, and so I'm just highlighting that we allocated funds to, you know, create new positions and to do all of these things. And that comes from the grand list. And while I appreciate that there will be addition to the grand list, you know, 50%, um, you know, residents aren't paying 50% of their taxes, they are paying all of their taxes. And I think that businesses need to pay their share. And are there ways to do this that businesses and residents both pay their fair share? Absolutely. I don't think this is it. Right. If I may, and I don't mean to argue with the, the council member on a policy matter, um, but just matter of information, first of all, um, commercial housing projects would be eligible for this. But so, renters, like homeowners but the, but, here, aren't. In, no, single family homes, but that's by state law. Also renovation, we, we were actually talking with a renovation of commercial properties. And I'd add that uh, the three times it's been before the voters, including residents, it has actually received pretty large support by the voters. So it's not something that residential voters in the community don't agree with. So but just toss I would, that out there. No. I, would, I would highlight I mean, I that there are, there are reasons that people are able to vote. And, yeah. you know, and there's a lot of people who aren't at the table, who aren't heard. And I think it's incumbent upon us as counselors to, to just be mindful that I think there are people that acknowledge that this policy is not effective as, as it is. And there's a leaves a lot to be desired. But it just it really does not sit well. I have uh, dual loyalties, as you've, as you've heard, but I'm also a 20 year resident. Uh, and, and firmly believe that growing the grand list and having more people working in the city are, are, are your goals and they're, and, and they're things that should continue to happen. Yeah. So. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Aye. So that was a uh, motion carries. Um, and uh, th thank you uh, okay. very much. Thank you all. I appreciate yeah. your time. Go on to the next job of the city. Okay, awesome. Great. <laughs> okay. All right, so, uh, all right, we're up to the responsible employer ordinance. So, uh, this was a, an item brought uh, by Councillor Casey. Do you want to introduce this? Yeah, and I, I, I would just give a brief introduction to it. Um, I've invited a few guests to weigh in on this. Um, so I don't know if uh, right now, Tim, Larry, and Danielle, if you want to maybe sit at the uh, round table in the front there. Might have some other folks chime in. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something I've been looking at since I got on the council, and uh, I think it dovetails pretty well with our previous discussion. Um, I, I was hardened when I got on this council to see that we treat people, I think, more than just numbers on a spreadsheet. Um, 
you know, we've, we've put in place a social responsibility committee uh, to look at issues around, you know, workers' rights. And, um, you know, I think generally, if we look at our municipal employees, we do quite well by them. We have three unions in the city here. Um, ne negotiations are very respectful. Um, but, as you notice, we're also doing a lot of building in the city here and a lot of contracting. Um, and as we look at this, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that there is a category of worker who is largely invisible, I think, uh, not only in the state of Vermont, but around the country here. Um, my brother is a plumber in New York City who works on construction sites, and he often tells me about the routine abuse of the ban actors in some of these construction firms who bring people on board and treat them as less than humans. Um, I, I, I would say just in talks with you know city staff, I think we do a lot better um, as far as who, who we work with, you know, um, who gets some of these construction contracts. But what we contend with every day um, is the lack of oversight, both on the federal and the state level. Uh, we have a state government who tried to merge the Agency of Commerce and the Department of Labor pretty recently, I think, which tells you something about the oversight that they have. Uh, I had somebody call up the Department of Labor recently um, to give a complaint about something happening uh, with abuse, and they said, we're too understaffed to even look at it here. As, uh, you know, as Montpelier and as we spend you know, tens of millions of dollars of taxpayer dollars on some of these projects, I think we need to think uh, about the human level again here and who's working on some of these jobs. And, you know, as Ashley points out, and I always appreciate this, is the person carrying a pipe on one of these construction sites making enough to actually live in our city? And, you know, I think the answer is no in a lot of cases here. So uh, going forward, you know, I would like to talk about putting an ordinance into place that weeds out some of these bad actors on the front end. Um, so we don't find ourselves well into a project and find cases of wage theft, misclassification, abuses as far as the Affordable Care Act and other standards at the state and federal level. Um, and I think there are ways to do that. And a lot of cities have already implemented uh, responsible contracting ordinances. I think it's about 250 at this point, um, Portland being one of the most recent ones. So I want to at least uh, today start generating a bit of discussion around this issue. Again, keeping in mind that we have some projects in the pipeline here. Uh, I'm not by any means an expert, uh, but I did bring in some folks who I, I think could talk about this with a, a level of sophistication that I can't. Uh, so I've asked uh, these folks to give about 15 or 20 minutes, just talking about what the problem is now that they see in the state, uh, some solutions that they'd like to see ways to address this. I actually do have some uh, language I've been working on uh, myself here that I could certainly bring to a future council meeting, uh, but I, I think it's best to just talk about the concept of this before we get into the weeds uh, to really look at what some of the problems are. And uh, you know, I, again, I'm a layperson myself, but um, you know, I, I have family who've moved over from Ireland recently, uh, who are construction workers working the buildings trades there, um, and I've just been disgusted with some of the stories I hear. So. Um, you know, I'm happy to take any questions from the council, but I don't think there's anything I could answer that uh, would be outlined by the folks here. So, with your permission, Mike, sure. I'd yes. Like yes. Go turn ahead. it over to uh, Larry, Danielle, and Tim here. If you want to introduce <coughs> yourself. I'm Where you come from? Start. I'm Larry Moquin. I uh, am a resident of Swan, Vermont. Um, I I brought a little testimony. Good evening, Mayor Watson and members of the council. My name is Larry Moquin. I'm here tonight uh, in support of the Responsible Employer Ordinance you guys might put in place. I'm a lifelong resident of Vermont. I'm a member of Labor's Local 668, which covers Vermont and New Hampshire. I'm Vice President of the Vermont Building Trades, and I'm also an organizer with the Labor's International Union of North America in New England. I'm second generation laborer. Um, I'll give you a little background on what it's like to be a union member in the construction industry in our state. Um, I had a good childhood. It was only due to sacrifices my parents made for us, like me and my siblings. On uh, Sunday, we'd have dinner every, uh, every Sunday night, and then my father would pack his stuff, and either later that night or before we got up Monday, he would leave, and we wouldn't see him again till Friday night. 
our mother did a good job. We all turned out pretty good. She held down the homestead during the week because he had to travel out of state to provide us a shot at the, you know, the blue collar middle class life that we all deserve and also still plan for his future. Um, hasn't been any different for me in the 17 years I've been doing this. Um, I'm very proud to be a union laborer. Um, I've worked here in Vermont some, but I've traveled more than my fair share to uh, you know, continue this dream that my father instilled in me. Um, he's been a laborer for over 50 years now and is living like a wonderful life. In his golden years, he lives in Florida now, but that's only due to the fringe benefits and retirement that he earned through being in this union. Um, the employers that he and I worked for are, you know, the definition of responsible contractors. Many of them are fa small family owned businesses. And the, you know, the main reason that he earned a comfortable retirement and hopefully the reason I'll be able to retire someday. I believe like Montpelier as the capital of our state. You guys never really have been followers and you should lead the way with an ordinance like this to show that the city cares about the hardworking men, men and women that uh, build the infrastructure here and make the city as vibrant as it is now. Um, construction workers deserve a, sh a shot at a human right of work hard and get a fair wage and also make it a livable. Employers who, who provide family supporting wages and benefits and invest in wor workforce training and apprenticeships are actually going to benefit your local economy. Um, Passing this ordinance will level the playing field and ensure a minimum threshold for bidders to compete. And it'll also limit irresponsible contractors who have the potential to cost the city precious dollars. It'll require the bidders and the subcontractors to demonstrate that they can and will comply with the bid documents and the specifications that are in these documents. Wage theft, theft misclassification of workers' compensation and unemployment fraud is a real problem in the state. Uh, it cost the taxpayers millions, and it was shown in a report just recently, February 15th of this year, the Vermont Legislative Committee uh, released. Um, there are responsible contractor proposals in many areas that have been useful at uh, guarding against this type of fraud. Um, along with this ordinance, it'll, it'll also benefit women and minority workers who are often paid less by guaranteed they're paid by worker classification and not by gender or race. Um, it also has potential to generate revenue back to the city and the state by making sure contractors are providing and paying the correct amount of unemployment insurance and workers' compensation insurance. Um, and just so you know, this isn't a union versus non-union issue. Uh, the ordinance applies to all the bidders, and it's an example of good policy to protect working families, the taxpayers here, and the city. Um, the ordinance doesn't give an advantage to union contractors. It only gives an advantage to responsible contractors. It asks that any contractor who wish to benefit from public dollars play by the rules of fair and honest contracting. That's what I have to say, and uh, I'd like to introduce you to Dan and Tiffany Boyvin. They live in Northfield. They're married, expecting their first child, both members of the laborers. And then Calvin Foster, he's a single father, used to live in Montpelier, had to move because he couldn't afford to live here. He lives in Colchester now, and he's also a member of the local. Thank you. I'm gonna let Danielle go next because I'm more like Larry's father. <laughs> oh, oh, good to know. <laughs> awesome. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Danielle Bombardier. I'm a licensed electrician with the International Brotherhood of Electric Workers, Local 300. Um, I now also am the training director and an organizer for Local 300, uh, which serves the state of Vermont. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Connor um, and for you all for listening to the discussion. I think it's an important discussion and for allowing us to speak here this evening. I'm happy to be speaking after this last topic um, following the discussion of a livable wage and creating jobs um, and paying people enough to actually stay in Montpelier and live in Montpelier. <clears throat> I'm new to the building trades as well um, within the last few months. And when I first heard of this concept of responsible employer agreement, I, I was a little confused. Maybe I'm a little naive. Um, but you see, I've had the privilege of working in the IBEW. 
um, the electrician's union. And I'm pretty new. Um, I started at age 26, began my apprenticeship four months after I started. Pay raises followed the contract, um, even for apprentices. Health insurance, retirement benefits were provided. Um, and my working rights were protected through a collective bargaining agreement, our responsible contract. Uh, working in the IBEW was my first experience in construction, um, and it was fairly smooth. Um, I became pregnant on the job. I didn't get pregnant on the job, but I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that may be the single best line. Ever. <laughs> 24 years of being in this job. <laughs> Just cause. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, worked, uh, I worked on the job until my due date, and um, I was provided benefits during my maternity leave. This experience is not universal, especially for women, but I didn't have to worry that I was making 84 cents for every dollar that the man next to me was making doing the same job because of the way we were classified, all the same. Um, we made the same wage, and it was a good one. My wage increased every year through the apprenticeship. And when I first became licensed, I was able to buy a house in the community where I worked. Um, I'm a Colchester resident. I grew up in Colchester, left and came back because it's Vermont. Um, and earning a livable, responsible wage is, is important, I'm, as we heard. Um, if, if one can't afford to live in the community where they work, you, you tend to resent it. You can build it, but you can't enjoy it. You can come here to work every day, but you can't afford to bring your family here for dinner. And because I was working under a contract, one that required the contractor to act responsibly, I progressed through the apprenticeship flawlessly. There was no snafus with the contractor not registering me with the state, not recording my hours, not getting pay raises, not paying for my classes. And as apprenticeship director for the IBEW now, I meet with a lot of people who come in who face these obstacles with their current contractors. The responsible contractor language that I think Connor has a copy of, um, it requires contractors to employ registered apprentices and licensed individuals, ensuring that the people on the job are receiving adequate training and have adequate licensure and experience in their particular trade. Essentially, it shows a level of commitment to the craft, which in turn shows up in the quality of the work that's performed. We all want the state's capital to look good. Secondly, it prevents contractors from hiring people on the promise to register them as apprentices and then waste their time keeping them back on their path to becoming a well-paid licensed individual. Before I worked in construction, I didn't, I didn't really notice it. Buildings went up and I enjoyed using them. I didn't think about who built them, how they were built, but now I do. The built environment stands long after we're all gone. And that's one of the reasons I've enjoyed working in the trade, leaving an imprint on the world. Montpelier has the opportunity to provide something valuable to its residents through this ordinance. The city can provide an example of what it looks like to take care of the construction workers who build the city with the city's money. Montpelier can provide its residents and local workers a better quality of life with this ordinance, rather than line the pockets of business owners or CEOs. Unfortunately, it takes rules and contracts to make employers do the right thing and treat employees responsibly and fairly. Um, but fortunately, you have the power to enforce this through um, a simple ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. I have some questions, but uh, if, was there one more speaker? Oh, I'm sorry, did you? Go ahead, when it's fresh in your mind. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm happy to wait. You go ahead. Um, my name's Tim LeBombard. I'm um, president of IBW Local 300 and the Vermont Construction and Building Trades. Um, unlike these two, I've not fairly new. <laughs> okay. I've got 32 years in the trade, and it, it's sad to say, and I hope it gets better by the time I get out that these problems are solved. It's been <coughs> happening. I've held all the positions that Danielle currently holds through my career, and it's sad that apprentices come in, and or they come in and they think they're apprentices, and we call the state, Judy Borbo, and um, how much? How many hours does Tommy have documented? Well, Tommy who, and he has none. And I was told by my contractor that he was taking care of it. You know, it's they don't educate them um, because it's cheaper. 
and that's one of the things with these ordinances you'll have that they have to have indenturement. It's there's the process is out there. People just <laughs> abuse it and abuse the the kids. They don't know any better, you know. So it's it, it's not fair, but it happens too much. And our ordinance, which is our constructive bargaining agreement, is uh, our contractors would well as president of the the local and everything we police our own it's human nature they try to get away with things but we're there we have this ordinance we have the contract they have to follow there's no um, gray areas it's written so we have to do it and we police them which would happen here you'd have uh, documents to back what you're doing there would be no guesswork and um, right now we're speaking with Burlington to get it done and as far as the livable wage goes the thirteen dollars and something it's <laughs> I it's a joke. They got that. <laughs> we have the uh, the Vermont State prevailing wage rate, which we worked on as the building trades and everything from 1996. That I can remember was the first time we brought it up. We got it passed in 2016. 16, it uh, it it took effect in 2016, where they had the rates, which is for a uh, journeyman wireman electrician in Burlington, Chittenden County, is twenty six dollars an hour plus. 42 and a half percent benefits so they they added the benefits and they bumped it on and that's what the vermont state prevailing livable wage is for an electrician or it is i mean that's what you need you know here there that that gives you a pension it gives you health health insurance and you're not going on social welfare which nobody should have to you should give somebody the the chance to make their own living and pay for their own. Do, do you know if that prevailing wage is tied to the like the Davis Bacon prevailing wage or is it separate for Vermont? It's separate. It's totally separate and it's yeah. totally here and here. This is Davis Bacon. No, that's it's what I thought. Yeah, that's what I was curious. Yeah, Vermont State prevailing wage now is it, it supersedes right. and it exceeds Davis Bacon right. in a lot of places now. The Davis Bacon's been stagnant. And um, as, as Vermont is, we have to get through because everybody knows that the Green Mountains are beautiful, but it's, you know, you got to be able to pay to live here, and that's all trying to do. You go into New York State and you make 40% more just across the way. <coughs> um, that's all I've got. I think this, this is great, and it's, it's happening all over the nation um, with the, their different um, titles, but it's all the same thing. It's fair contract, yeah. and it's uh, to stop the cheaters. Okay. There's over 20 states that have these already um, throughout the country. <coughs> and like Connor said, over 250 cities and towns. Do you mean uh, like states that have adopted? No, um, the, the cities in states. Oh, okay. There are okay. 20 states okay. representing 250 cities okay. have some sort of either responsible employer, responsible contractor, responsible bidder, community benefit agreement. And I mean, our state really, if you look at it, is no different than any of those states in our you know, overall thinking um, has a little bit progressive, a little bit um, more for the people. Cool. I have questions, but I'm going to hold off. Um, questions from the council? I was just, there was yeah, a yeah. study that came out in 2018, and I just, it's called Out of Reach, uh, and it was published in 2018, and it focuses mostly on a housing wage. But uh, it's put out by the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And in Vermont, we are the 13th highest housing wage in the country with an average. And Chittenden County is actually, they also had a differential. I want to say it was about a 22% differential. Um, but in general, in Vermont, it's $22.40 an hour to afford housing, like, which is 85 hours a week at our minimum wage. Other comments? Uh, okay, so my questions, uh, well, so first of all, Mark Me Down is interested. Like, this seems hugely important. And, you know, and as far as we can make a dent uh, towards this, that seems like a something, uh, you know, steps we should take. Um, uh, my questions are really around the, the logistics of it. Um, you know, it's one thing to put in an ordinance and say you have to do this. The other side of that is the enforcement. And so, could you speak about what the enforcement of this hat either looks like in other places or just what that entails? 
most of the time enforcement is taken out of it because if you do it before the job starts, you don't need to enforce anything because the employer is going to be responsible and through the bid documents and specifications, if they follow them correctly, then you guys will know that they're going to do it. And the ones who don't follow the documents go in the garbage. Right, but so, how do you but say, how do we, how do you, how do you verify that they're actually, you know, so they say, I'm going to pay you $25 an hour. Um, and then how do I actually know if, while the job's going on that they're really doing it? They said they would. In, the in these bid documents, in a lot of them, <laughs> um, it'll say that they have to have a worker's log, um, a sign in, sign out sheet. Um, all stuff that can be presented back to the city on a weekly, a bi-weekly, a monthly basis. Um, so you know that. And those are effective, in your opinions, that those work? I mean, it's do, the only way they do. Work. You have so have there's it. no heat from the someone to say you sign this, you know, even though it's wrong. A responsible employer wouldn't think it. No, was I know that. I'm just uh, trying to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying to understand that's the questions I'm going to get asked. Right. Mm -hmm. no, so, right. right. But like, and a responsible employer yeah. would have no problem. Right following right. the rules because it's going to be the rules they want for to, everybody. Yeah. Well, sure. The, the issue, though, is with the people who uh, aren't. aren't. Right. So, I mean, because even just by having the ordinance, you're probably going to have, um, you know, an increase in people acting responsibly. And that's that's good. Uh, but, uh, yeah, with some... Uh, be tried to have. It's, they're still going to try. Right, exactly. They're still going to try, and I just want to. Part of what you do is make sure they're yeah. following the rules. Right. Right. right here, possibly yeah. in Lockheed, or that we're checking out. Right. right. And I, I just want to make sure that we are being just, um, you know, eyes open about, um, you know, is there staff time on on our part that it goes in goes into checking those logs, or and and that's you know potentially fine. I don't know, but um, it's something that we should just be conscious of. That's all. Um, Ashley, there's a. I'm actually. I did a little bit of research about this because I was curious, and I'd seen it called other things, and I wasn't sure if it was the same thing. Turns out it is. <laughs> so the Indiana, Illinois, Iowa um, Foundation for Fair Contracting actually has a whole bunch of information that answers a lot of these questions, and it actually becomes part of the contracting process. So if they violate any of those provisions, they're actually in breach of contract, which makes them liable for damages. Um, and it also uh, talks about, and I can email this to everybody, but um, there are a number of these coalitions in various parts of the country that, that seem to do this. Um, and one of the things that they mention that caught my eye, at least in this particular one, um, they actually have to provide sworn statements, which opens them up to the pains and penalties <laughs> of perjury. Um, but it also requires that they provide a list of employees and that they be um, classified. And then we, as the um, offeror of a contract, are able to call Secretary of State and other relevant licensing agencies to, in fact, verify uh, <coughs> that they have done all of those things. Um, and so while it would certainly be, you know, a little bit of heavy lifting up front, I, I think in the long term, you know, the, the enforcement piece, there is an enforcement piece and would people breach the contract? Sure. Lawyers wouldn't have, like lawyers wouldn't exist if people didn't breach contracts. So I'm a little bit grateful that sometimes people do. But, um, you know, I, I think the way that contracts are written can really alleviate a lot of that enforcement piece. And then there are legal remedies that are clearly spelled out so that everybody is on notice what the potential penalties could or would be. Well, we, and we do have, just for everyone, you know, when we do, regardless of whether they're fair or not, we do Davis-Bacon jobs. We have, you know, it's pretty spelled out, and we, there are worker surveys, and you have to verify. So it's not like we've never done this sort of thing. I was just hoping it was maybe a little less uh, burdensome than the Davis-Bacon is, and you got more money out of it. I, I believe it would be with the contracts, like you're saying. And, and as a point of interest, um, currently at the State House, they're working on, a, I believe it's S-182, um, a bill to move enforcement of all licensing laws, misclassification, and everything from the DOL to the uh, AG's office. It's, it's S-108. That's what you want to look at. Um, which is, uh, it just was read last Wednesday for the third time the Senate's going to the House without any deals and the Attorney General's welcoming it open, with open arms. And it's, it's going to give them more uh, more staff to do these things, and they would be responsible for any of your projects. Also, I mean, it's it's a violation of state law. So, 
Connor. Yeah, just, just a couple of quick points too. One, you would of course set a threshold on this for the cost of the project, right? So you're not talking every $10,000 project, jumping through all these hoops, but some of the bigger ones, I'm thinking like $200,000 plus. You know, it does make sense putting some staff time, I think, in the front end to make sure you do it right there. The other thing is, and I want to echo Bill, I think we're doing a lot right right now in Montpelier, but it makes sense to codify that in an ordinance then, if you're doing it right, because there's going to be turnover, you know, let's make sure we keep doing it right. Great. Uh, so some of the next steps that seem apparent to me on this are uh, just to uh, check in with Tom McArdle and you said you have some language that you're yep, yep. working on and um, I think it might be good to uh, have a comparison between um, uh, what the language that you all you know, have have written so far compared with current practices just so we know what that mm -hmm. change might look like and uh, and you know just the, be uh, conscious of uh, the enforcement side uh, and what that might take um, I, I will just also put it out there too that uh, this might be the kind of thing that the social and economic justice committee um, at least should be aware of um, and I mean they may not have time to do a full vetting of it, but um, I, I think it's worth um, touching base with them. Donna. And like the website that Ashley talked about, I'd love more yes. information because we didn't get any language, so all we got was you were <coughs> here you are and here's the title. Right. <laughs> and I had an idea what it was, but it really helpful to get more information as we work on the weeds and how they interface. You, so, you, thank you. If you're uncomfortable with this, that's fine. Please don't answer. Um, or maybe we can co talk privately. I'm just, are there some companies, contractors you'd recommend that we could talk to about you know the responsible ones about how, how this has worked from their perspective and if it changed the cost of their projects and those kind of things just so we can get that information i can get you some contacts yeah that'd be great we'll work on that tomorrow and yeah yeah obviously you right. don't want to yeah. out them without right. checking with them first but it would just be helpful because we will hear from the contracting community it'd be nice to have you so you're looking for like a municipality or of some sort or municipality or even you said many of you talked about I we work for contractors so I, yeah. I, the way I understand it the contractor hires the union right. to do the, the electrical work so are there mass major contractors that, that you think are good employers that follow these things that we oh, could okay. talk with yeah. and say if you've adopted these practices did that change the price of your bids? Have you had trouble getting jobs because you know? Have you, how hard is it to do? Because that's you know that's we're going to get asked about that too. How much more is this going to cost the city if projects cost more and those kind of things? So I'm just starting to hook up with the AGC to get something yeah, from yeah yeah AGC. So would be I'm not being things as yep. that. that's fine. We'll probably drop mm -hmm. some Appreciate that. You know, it'd be good for their legit ground trackers. Um, we done. have other guests in the audience if they would like to to make a comment I'd love to hear from you I mean I appreciate <laughs> you giving the time but I'd like to hear what you have to say if you want <laughs> <laughs> I knew you could do it. so obviously this is my first child and working union as a laborer I would not have been able to do even fathom the thought of having a kid without having um, these, the wages that we get. Um, I get paid just the same amount as my husband, as a, <laughs> doing the same work. I, I, you know, go to work, you bust your butt, and you make the same amount. Um, getting more work that, into the, into, you know, the area that'll, um, <laughs> Excuse me, I'm nervous. Um, You're doing great. <laughs> but getting getting more responsible contractors high, you know, into the area would be so beneficial to so many families. Um, when it, I used to live in Oregon for the longest time, and I was a union member in nursing homes out there, and I moved to Vermont, and it was so different here that you know I didn't make a livable wage. What you know, I made more than what you guys are saying is as a livable wage, it's not. The state is saying. Yeah. <laughs> the state is saying it's a livable wage. It's not. It's not. Um, so I moved into construction so that I could make a life <clears throat> in my family. So need more of it. Thank you. Could you also say your name? 
I'm Tiffany Bowen. And where are you, where are you from? Northfield. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Daniel Bowen. Uh, I'm Tiffany's husband. Um, she was a nursing assistant for quite a few years when we moved back into Vermont from Oregon. Uh, she was continuing to do that same profession, and she wasn't she wasn't making a living. So I kind of convinced her to come to work with me, <laughs> and she hasn't looked back. And she's actually you know thriving. Sometimes she commands more respect and attention than I do on a job site. And I, I'm a, like a Swiss Army knife on a job site, and she's awesome. <laughs> so, um, we just bought our we just bought a house in Northfield uh, last month. And I've, that's been a dream of mine since I was this big. I wouldn't have been able to do it without a union. You know what I mean? Just the, the little wages and, and a kid on the way. We're not paying a lot of hospital bills because of our, our benefits. So that's a lifesaver all by itself. Now, I can't imagine myself doing any ty other type of work. I mean, there's a company called PC that works over in Burlington. I can't go work for them. We don't make the same. We do the same job, and I make more than they do, with benefits included. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, you'd have to be an idiot to say no to that. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm with her. <laughs> Completely. You got my vote. <laughs> okay. Um, Lauren, you had something you wanted to say? Um, yeah. First of all, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Really appreciate the time and perspectives on this important issue and look forward to digging into it. Um, I just wanted to note that I brought this up at the last social and economic justice uh, meeting oh, a week ago that this was coming up and we talked about, we're trying to develop like a checklist of questions to go through as one initial step and thought that this would be a great policy to, to use as a way to kind of test out how we um, can really try to make sure that we're doing a really good policy all around. Um, so we look forward to, to engaging in this and um, great. I'm happy to come to the next meeting. Fabulous. Let's talk. Great. Further comments? I did want to let you guys know I passed on that the document I was reading from to Bill um, so there, I, there's a lot of them that exist, though, and I have a couple more that I'll email out when I get home. Hopefully it'll be an early night. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for taking thank the time you. to come thank speak to us. Long. This is great. Thank you for fighting the good fight. Yeah. <laughs> and, to and to be continued. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, how are we doing, team? Are you okay? Do you need a break? Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Uh, all right. So, next up is. Uh, yeah, um, so, yeah, fair enough. So, um, we have a heads up that there was a gentleman who would like to make a comment that missed the general business and appearances um, at the beginning. So, if you want to come talk to us oh. now, now is okay. Right. Interrupting our. Regularly scheduled program. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Tom Mulholland. I live uh, in Lane Shops, One Mechanic Street, which is District One. Uh, before I say anything, it says pictures worth a thousand words. So if these pictures could be passed around, <clears throat> I. Uh, I'd like to preface my remarks by saying that I think the city of Montpelier, given the severity of the winters we have, does a great job in taking care of the streets and the sidewalks. And uh, I realize we don't have a super huge budget to contend with all unexpected events. That being said, uh, even in championship games, uh, whether it's Steph Curry or Bill Belichick or whoever, they can always point out to certain blunders. And that's why I'm here this evening, to point out a blunder. Uh, I, I've been living at uh, Warren Mechanic Street in the lane shops, which my apartment abuts right on the North Branch and also right on the pedestrian walkway. And uh, I don't know why, my first winter, there wasn't any problem. This winter, all winter, uh, it's been a nightmare, and you can see from those pictures. And 
The, I'd like to also say that because it's been, from day one, it's been, you can see from the pictures, ice, ice, <coughs> ice. And this particular spot, I don't know if you're familiar with the pedestrian walkway, arguably, it's one of the prettiest sites in the city. And it's heavily trafficked by pedestrians. Forget about the fact that it's a loading zone for that building. Kids going from and to school, from the meadow neighborhood and whatnot, go back and forth, people walking their dogs, young lovers, old couples, mothers with their baby strollers, bicyclists, it's heavily trafficked. That it should look that way is a blunder. And <clears throat> the other thing is that building uh, that it butts it, well, I live there myself, uh, <clears throat> I don't like to call myself a senior citizen, more an old codger, right? I'm 70 years of age. Every person in that building is a senior citizen. And <clears throat> that door that goes into that, unlike the front door, it's a handicapped accessible thing. So if an ambulance had to come to that building, they'd go in that alleyway, they'd have a hell of a time getting that gurney out and <clears throat> to get into that building. It's, the ice is there, there's not enough room to negotiate an ambulance. It's just absurd. I, <clears throat> I spoke with, uh, I spoke with um, <clears throat> Lorna, one of the, uh, she's the assistant director over at Montpelier Housing Authority. And she said, she spoke with the plow person. The plow person said, oh well, <clears throat> I come through here sometimes, there's someone parked here because it's a loading zone because old people who are getting out with a walker or they need help with their, their groceries with their, with their son or daughter or whatever and there's a car parked there. <clears throat> so he says, well, it, it complicates the plowing thing. So <clears throat> I have to say that that is BS because as I say, I live right next to that alleyway. And at six o'clock in the morning, whether it's snowing or not, that guy, I hear that plow go back and forth. There's no one in that driveway. There's no one in that pedestrian way. <coughs> so, <clears throat> when I, uh, Lorna told me that a number of people had complained about it to her, and, uh, and it didn't go any further, so, <clears throat> I called the city garage, and I spoke with Eric down there, I guess he's a uh, maintenance foreman for this stuff, and he said he would talk about it with Bill Tuttle. Well, I haven't heard anything, and nothing's been done, and so I thought <clears throat> the only way that I could see forward would be to come here, and hopefully there are other citizens in Montpelier viewing this, or will view it, and uh, you know, the... Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, the uh, proverbial saying, the, uh, the creakiest wheel gets greased first. So I'm just here hoping that <laughs> this wheel will get greased. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so Mr. Mulholland, I can follow up on your comments. I actually walked through there. I'm sorry? I walked through there with my wife and dogs this weekend and observed that. And I said, what's that? Because like you, I walked through there a lot. And I said, um, I don't remember this from the past. I made a note, our DPW director's on vacation this week, and I, he's due back uh, Friday, and I have an actually note to ask him about that, so I will follow up. And this actually is, Bill, this is actually looking good right. compared to because of the recent uh, melt. The but, you know, we're not out of the winter. Right. That stuff's going to freeze. Yeah. So, anyway. I got it. So we're on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Donna. Just living in that same neighborhood, the complication is that that part of Franklin Street does not belong to the city. The city does not plow that part. So they only part the other part mechanic that comes to there. And it's been an extremely icy winter, but he's right. It really needs attention. It really needs attention. Thank you. Is it the city's responsibility to keep that clear or not? I'm not sure what. I don't know. That's what we're going to check we're on. We're going to find oh, out. It's not. It, we don't know. We'll, we'll find out. I, I don't have a direct answer for you. It's a pedestrian walkway, is it not? It's used that way, and it connects to the bridge that the city does have a snowplow right. that goes through. We have the... Oh. I mean, we can it's a joint connection, but this, so. 
I don't, right I don't have any answers one way or the other for you right now, but I'm, I'm going to get them because that was my question. Is that us or is that the housing people? Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, we can get into like details and stuff and look into things, but it says about this councilors and mayor, um, the city council is the legislative body of the community responsible for developing policies and ordinances that preserve and protect the health, safety, and welfare of all of our residents. And I think that takes precedence over any nitpicking about whose property it is. Uh, no, no, Tom, not, I, I just meant we need to work with them. We need to work on it, absolutely. I wasn't trying to bypass it. Yeah. But we need to work with them because there's some property is theirs and some is the city's. That's all. We need to work with them on it and get it resolved. You're right. We agree. We're agreeing we're, with We're you. all on the same page here. No, but uh, all, I'm saying is, all I'm saying is it is plowed. All I'm saying is do a, a good job. It's icy and water. Here it's it a is. mess. Yep. Thank you. We'll follow up. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so on to uh, the rental inspection program. So welcome back. Yes. Mike Miller. Thanks for taking some time to tell us or explain to us how rental so, you know, inspection programs work. Bill well, I was just going to tee this one up as well. Um, this was one of the last things on our uh, to-do list from last year's goals and priorities was to have a conversation about this. And uh, Mike was uh, worked in Barrie for a number of years before he came to us where they have such a program. So what I asked him to do was just to give you a, con you know, to have a conversation about what it looks like, what it may or may not happen, you know, include what uh, pros and cons were in Barry, successes and, and problems, and then get a sense from the council whether this is something we wanted to continue looking at or not, and if so, you know, maybe get together a working group of renters and landlords or you know, housing task force and people and figure out how we want to proceed and and, and all that. So, um, with that said, I'll turn it over to Mike. Okay, so. Um I apologize that we were only able to kind of get on this. We uh, had a number of big things going on last week that didn't let us get this out for you in advance, but I did leave um, <coughs> for you guys to review just a quick summary of, you know, what rental inspection programs are. Um, as Bill mentioned, uh, from 2008 to 2014, I was the planning director in the city of Barrie. They are one of a few communities that have a rental inspection program. And the primary purpose for rental inspection programs is to uh, protect the public health, safety, and welfare. Um, but it's really looking uh, primarily at making sure that we have safe, sanitary, and fit human habitation. Um, so the goals of these programs um, is uh, to maintain that piece. So there are some things that sometimes um, kind of get mixed into that discussion. Um, when we're looking at minimum standards for habitability, we're usually looking at these minimum standards. Uh, and what I handed out includes um, a checklist from what Barry has on theirs, which includes mostly in the left column fire and life safety requirements, but in the right column are those minimum housing standards, which is what you have usually for a rental inspection program. Um, we already do the inspections on the left through our building and fire code inspections if we get a complaint. Um, but the, really the new ones would be ones for minimum housing would be some of the ones that are on the right where we would look at, you know, do, does every room have two working outlets? Only one is required if there's a light fixture. Do doors and windows have locks? Do they have smokes and COs? Do you have running potable water? Do you have hot water? Do you have flushing toilets? or pro and proper wastewater connections, um, doors that close, roofs that don't leak. So it doesn't look at things like quality of unit finishes or the price or the availability and proximity, proximity of parking. Mike, so can I interrupt you? Yep. You were talking about things on the left versus the right. And so okay. I, went to, I went here. Uh, OK, this is the page I should be looking at? Yeah, that's just a checklist that Barry has for the left and the right. So, and when you say the left, I mean, there's a P column and an F column, and then there's uh, the, literally like the big left, the big that's pass-fail. So big left column versus this, right. 
this versus this. Okay, yeah. and so, I mean, are the things underneath miscellaneous that are continued over in the right, like? Yeah, there's a couple of things that roll over in their miscellaneous, but with the minimum housing in the right-hand side. Okay, that's the, what's included, that would be included in a rental uh, inspection. Um, yes. But the things on the left generally uh, are things that are already done if you get complaints. Yes. Okay, sorry. Thank you for yes. letting me interrupt. Carry on. That's fine. I want to be clear. Um, so you usually what we're looking at um, are things that really are related to very specific health, safety, and welfare. Um, they are, um, if, if we were interested in going in that direction, they, they're expensive and they're administratively heavy to, to kind of run these types of programs. Uh, in, in Barry, we weren't having a lot of success. We had one person that was working on it when I started, uh, and handled the electrical inspections and most of the, and the housing inspections. Over time, we migrated that to the fire department um, because they had additional staff who could work on it. Uh, and they also had the training in the fire inspections as well, so they were kind of making a, a slightly different process. So they actually had three people working on it. But it can be, depending on how you set it up, it can be, it can be expensive. And there are some pros and cons, which I put in a table on the, the next, uh, on page two. Um, and really, one of the one of the issues it just comes down to is the cost of being able to run these types of programs. Um, you know, if it's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, if you want the program to pay for itself, and you want to have an inspection once every six years, it'd be about six hundred dollars a year per unit. Divide by twelve months, you're adding fifty dollars per unit to the cost of that unit. Um, if you want, if you're not going to subsidize it with general fund dollars. And that's just, I mean, it may, it, those are just rough numbers just to start thinking about it. It's, it's not cheap, it's not easy, but if we have a big problem with the safety, um, then it's something that we should definitely can, can um, consider. So the pros of a rental inspection program is it does assure the house, that the housing is safe and sanitary. And certainly that is a goal the city would want to have. It does preserve existing housing stock, um, and it gives an accurate inventory of the rental housing stock. Some of the cons are that you know it is, it does result in rent increases or couldn't result in rent increases. There is an administrative requirement. Um, there's there's certainly a lot more work. It, it seems like it might not be, but it it takes quite a bit of time if you need to send out say fifteen hundred or a thousand invoices every year and then collect those invoices and catalog them and who's paid and then send out delinquency notices and collect delinquent incomes and and then pursue penalties and fines it, it's there's a certain amount of stuff that we had to deal with in Barry that really ate up a lot more time we, we spent a lot of time doing things that have nothing to do with helping the units get better can I ask you another question I'm sorry yep. to interrupt um, the hundred fifty thousand dollar cost per year—that's what would pay for a full-time inspector and an assistant. Is that right? I and I based that on, um, which was kind of in that second box, which was our current building inspecting um, department is ninety thousand dollars, and that pays for Chris, and he's separate. So I figured one inspector plus an assistant who can handle all the administrative paperwork and scheduling. There's a, there's a lot of scheduling. Unlike building inspections, you don't have to make a 48-hour appointment. Every inspection, mm -hmm. you have to contact the landlord. You have to contact the tenant. You've got to get 48 hours notice to the tenant. You've got to make sure you can be able to get in and get access. So usually you have an administrative person who is handling making all those appointments. So the so it was a second inspector and a half-time admin. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. I, I guess just, you know, based on the number of apartment units that we have, I just, like, $600, um, that, that math doesn't make sense to me. Um, so okay. I don't know where, was... yeah, I just want to flag that as, like, wait a minute. <laughs> I, because, I, uh, I mean, we have something like um, 1,400 yeah, apartment 15, 1,500 units. 1,500 units. Um, you did. At $600. 
per unit. That's way more than 150,000. Yes. Did that take into account, I think, the discussion that we had earlier, that we wouldn't have wire certain? That's 900,000. Yeah. Better expected. So is it off by a zero? My, he says 600 times 1,500 is $900,000. So it gives us plenty of money to run the program. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, well more than we need. <laughs> so I may have divided one number wrong in there. So it would be about $100 a unit. $100 a unit. Okay. Okay. So, so like $12 per month. Yeah. yeah eight, or less. I'm sorry. Yeah, that math yeah. I didn't do just right just now. But um, right. Okay. So. Okay. Good for catching my math. Yeah. Well, because, you know, $600 per year that feels like a lot but if it's a hundred dollars a year and I mean yeah and I've, all seen, things I've seen numbers still in other lot, communities but, yeah. that have that are in the hundreds of dollars per unit I don't know what Winooski's was in okay. see what theirs but uh, a couple of them have them but okay um, thank you just wanted to yes. flag that sorry thank carry on catching that yep even when I double check it I still get it wrong <laughs> um, and so the last point on those um, the last two cons is, is one is it doesn't have a significant impact on quality I mean while it is uh, affecting health and safety um, whether that two bedroom unit that's not in very good shape but is safe is $600 or $1,200 this wouldn't affect that um, and the last is that we, you, you have to consider even under state law which is attached as well um, on the next page you have to take into account the potential results of condemnation and eviction of tenants, and that would be the city's responsibility. So um, I did have the unfortunate experience of having to evict people for lack of housing standards and to take somebody who's um, clearly not in good financial conditions and make them homeless was not something I enjoyed doing. And it is something that every one of you would have to be willing to understand and accept that that is a potential consequence. Um, it didn't happen often, it only happened once, um, but it did happen and it does happen. And the, the threats of shutting somebody down are only good if we're willing to actually stand behind our threats that say, if you don't meet these standards, we will close your building down. So, and that was, that was all. I just wanted to put some pros and cons and get some stuff on the table, give you a little bit of information, the, the legislative housing codes are here. Um, and as I said, the checklist from Barry City was here, and I'll just take some questions and see. Okay, Ashley. I have a bunch of questions. Oh, good. So, how many apartments are there in Montpelier that have been reported for, I mean, major deficiencies like no heat, no running water, you know, a door that doesn't shut or lock, um, running potable water? I mean, that's. The, these are these are fundamental basics to me. So do we have a do we have a huge problem with that in Montpelier? As uh, when we asked our building inspector what what he gets, he gets about one complaint on average a month for for a condition, and it doesn't always mean that there is a problem. Sure. Um, and many times they come back to somebody who's getting evicted, who's trying to mm -hmm. sure. forestall the process. We. I think when we were talking with Bill this afternoon, we knew of one or two over, it, and it was time before I was here, of units that. When the city actually got involved and the took city them to court. actually right. ordered that. And yeah, so that's, that's kind of, that, at least that's been my experience, is like when there is an issue, you know, I as a tenant have had to call the city because the uh, abutting, you know, landlord didn't empty the dumpster one of those weeks where it was over 100 degrees for like every day and it smelled horrendous. But, uh, you know, um, so I guess this is not something that I find super exciting for a myriad of reasons, mostly because Montpelier is a small town. People are going to hear if, you know, if, if there are lots of units that are not even meeting these, like these are to me like basic habitability standards. I think we have mechanisms by which to deal with those already. Um, I have rented since I was 17, I moved out on my own at 17. Um, and to me, the things that have really become clear, I've had some amazing landlords here in Montpelier. I've had some pretty unresponsive landlords here. 
um, and everywhere else that I've lived, uh, you know, it's kind of been the same deal. One of the things that has really stood out to me as critical are upfront moving costs. This is hugely significant when you are talking about someone moving from one place to another. I picked up my entire life in Boston. I moved to Burlington because I wanted to find a place that was like kind of similar to where I had been for the last 10 years. Um, I had to come up with like $3,000 and I literally moved to Vermont with $3 in my checking account. Um, and Burlington had, you know, had a cap on what they could in, in terms of money up front, what they could take. Um, and Barrie also has a cap on that. Um, and I have talked to lots of folks in Barrie um, about what that actually translates to, which is a degree of mobility that a lot of us would not be able to experience otherwise. Because when you're moving into an apartment that you might be able to, you know, afford your monthly rental payments at $1,500 a month, that's just throwing a number out, um, you know, but then you have to come up with three months rent, first, last security, you know, that's $4,500 a month. I don't think any of my friends have like 4,500 bucks just chilling around to move, you know, and then you're doing the security deposit jockey. You've got to wait to get it from your old apartment, which if you're moving states away can be forever. And then if you don't get it back, then your land, you're, you know, it's, it's a disaster. Um, so one of the things I think is really security deposits or, or not even security deposits, just move in upfront costs. What kind of cash money needs to be put down to move in? Um, and one of the things that I think is something that we kind of need to talk about here in Montpelier is, is, is there an appetite to talk about what it's going to take for people to be able to move here? Because, you know, if the ask is you're going to come up with $6,000 first, last full security, that's going to cut a lot of people out. You know, if if there is an appetite to explore that, I think that's one way that we could start to, um, you know, get better. I mean, basic minimum things aside, which I think most units in Montpelier and I've seen a bunch of them at this point, you know, moving. I used to move like every more frequently than once a year. Um, you know, I haven't run into this. I think the other piece is in terms of moving out, you know, what kinds of things are landlords obligated to do? And there are minimums, you know, by state statute. Um, but uh, in terms of, you know, providing accountings and when those accountings need to be provided, if those accountings aren't provided, what are your remedies that are very clearly codified um, so that renters know like, hey, this is what you have to do. You didn't do this. Here's what I'm going to do in response to get what is legally mine. Um, you know, when you're dealing as a, I mean, as a renter myself and, and almost all of my friends here in town are renters as well. You know, that's a significant battle. If you are working full time and you've got all these other life responsibilities and now you've got to try to like figure out how you're going to get money back from an apartment that's just being withheld and you don't know why. Or you kind of get this nebulous like, oh, we took eight hundred dollars because there was a scratch on the wood floor. I, I mean, you know, as a renter, I'm entitled to documentation about that, but I also know that because I do other stuff. And so, so I happen to have that knowledge, but there are a lot of people <clears> who don't. And I think that making sure that people know what their options are as renters and what their legal rights and remedies are is critical, you know, to, to making sure that we, you know, don't end up in situations where tenants are being exploited. Um, the uh, the other piece that I'm really interested in, and I don't believe I know that there are federal laws about this, um, but um, uh, anti retaliation pr protections for tenants, you know, I um, not here, but in other places that I've lived, I actually have had to call a city inspector because, you know, plumbing wasn't functional for long periods of time. And the answer, you know, that I got as a tenant was oh, well, we're working on it. I'm not really sure what that means because I don't get to work on paying you my rent. I have to pay you my rent. Um, and, and so I really, I, I think that this is important stuff, but I'm wondering if there are other ways in which this can be subsumed. But um, if the goal is to make meaningful 
strides in terms of, you know, the the rental property options and the pool and expanding, um, you know, renter accessibility in Montpelier, I think those are very concrete, tangible things that realize significant benefits, you know, when you're talking about, you know, being mindful of every person who wants to move here in terms of economic ability, um, in terms of, you know, liquid assets, um, and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, I would hope that if, if a tenant calls and, and raises something like, you know, I haven't had water running water for three weeks but my rent is current i think the city would step in at, at that point Health i mean yeah. yeah um so it just it it seems like this is a, a jumping off point but i'm not sold that this is a way to i mean if it's only looking at bare minimums i i think you know most of our units meet that but there are other things that are way more important check I do have a few thoughts, having uh, spent a big part of my career representing low-income tenants in substandard housing. Uh, I think it's important. I, I, I think it might be worth people looking at uh, the actual regulations, which there's a state regulation called the uh, Rental Housing Health Code, um, which is uh, on the Health Department webpage. And if you Google Vermont Rental Housing Health Code, you'll find it. And it's about 10 pages. It's uh, it's pretty extensive. I don't... Uh, it requires a lot of things that uh, I think many of the apartments from tenants that I've uh, represented haven't complied with, including one thing, thing that's always been a big one to me is... Uh, exterior uh, walls, doors, and windows being reasonably weathertight. And mm -hmm. lots, especially in a place here like this where we have old housing, um, a lot of uh, apartments that I see are, are not reasonably weathertight. And, uh, and I think that's a big deal. And uh, it's something that causes increased costs for the tenants. Um, <clears throat> I was... Uh, part of the study look, looking into the uh, possibility of an inspection program back in 2004. Um, one of the big concerns that I've always had about an ins a program that is purely uh, inspection on complaint is that uh, it does give rise to retaliation. One, it gives rise to retaliation. Uh, retaliatory eviction is prohibited under Vermont law, not federal law, but under Vermont law. But it's uh, the protection isn't great, and it depends on being able to defend yourself in court and uh, and prevail on that. And so I think that uh, many tenants are reluct reluctant to uh, to complain because. They they know that uh, landlords are likely to retaliate by uh, by evicting them. So I oh, I want to push back a little when you say, well, a lot of the complaints, a lot of the times tenants complain is because they're being evicted. I think that for one thing, maybe if they're if an eviction is already in process, they know well I don't have anything to lose. I might as well complain. And two saying that they're complaining because they've gotten a, a termination notice has no bearing on whether there's merit to their complaints. Yeah, we always do investigate. I mean, it has nothing, our, our interest in investigating doesn't have anything to do with it. It's just when we do get them and we go through and realize there, there isn't much here and we ask the landlord, you know, because we've got to contact both, that's mm -hmm. usually when we find out that it's not you know, it's not surprising that this person has filed a complaint because we filed paperwork with them last week for a failure. You know, they haven't paid rent mm -hmm. in so many months, and we gave them the notice of eviction, and so we're not surprised to see this. But it's definitely, you know, I'll just follow up on that because we were talking about that in terms of what data we had, and, you know, we only have the complaints. So 
of the complaints, of the relatively few complaints we have, that none of them have been particularly serious, but we don't know the unreported complaints. Exactly, yeah. and that's another thing that I was going to say. The, fa the fact that we have a system that uh, inspects only on complaint means that we don't have a sense of the uh, general quality of housing in Vermont. We don't know, in Montpelier, we don't know how many uh, of the rental units we have do not comply with the Rental Housing Health Code, and having a systematic way of inspecting all the apartments or all the rental units on some regular basis is uh, is a way to address that and to provide enforcement even if the tenants are not complaining. And so I'm not saying we definitely have to do this. I think uh, when we were working on this in 2004, it was... Uh, received pretty well by the council right up to the point of uh, of budgeting and uh, <clears throat> and financial uh, the the budget is always an issue but uh, a, a lot of work was done to uh, to put that together that I I think it's work might be worth uh, looking at again to see whether we really want to pursue it um, So I think this is not something that we should reject out of hand. Uh, Glenn, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I'm more or less with you, Jack, on this. Um, I am uh, scared off by a couple of things. For example, uh, the enforcement and shutting down uh, 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 building and making, excuse me, making those tenants homeless, that is something that I would uh, dearly love to avoid, um, for sure. Um, I'm curious, and, and maybe I'm not understanding it the way you mean it, but, but uh, one... one question I have is about the, the con, no significant impact on quality uh because i guess it depends on what we what we're talking about in terms of the the word quality but when i look at the minimum housing checklist for barry there are at least some things that that feel to me like they are uh points of quality um that that would be worth inspecting regardless for example uh maybe a third of the way down minimum housing are all painted surfaces free of deteriorated paint. Um, that feels like something that I would bet many apartments would not pass. And I think it would be important. Uh, similarly, uh, walls sound and free from hazardous defects and so on. Uh, a lot of that kind of basic wall ceiling window. I, I bet that, I don't know, but I would, I would suspect that many apartments uh, do not pass some of those basic things. And I don't know uh, if you have a response to that, but just... Yeah, the, the sense for when I put that together to go and mention about housing uh, <coughs> quality was um, more the fact of, with respect to, um, you know, an apartment with 1970s shag carpeting right. and, and kitchen cabinets without doors on them and, you know, uh, an old refrigerator that maybe is a little too small and makes funny noises, but it works. You know, those are the types of things um, where the rental inspection will go in is to make sure that you've got the GFCI protection on your outlets and you've got, you know, it's, it's more health and safety when you, when you go out. There are improvements and it is an improvement in quality, but yeah. And there may be um, some that are cosmetic that will make an improvement in quality, you know, repainting those walls that may have the dings and the holes. Um, yeah, and, and specifically on that, uh, around here, I think if there's, uh, you know, chipped and deteriorated paint, I wouldn't uh, have my toddler there because chances are there's lead paint somewhere under there. And, you know, I... I did some uh, 
kind of low grade remediation on a on an apartment that my brother is in in Boston when he had his kids because you know they'll eat that paint. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Just because I think it is important, and I think it speaks to Ashley's kind of getting this out to, to folks um, that understand it as a former life as a property manager. One of the requirements by the state health department to speak to Glenn is that every year, every landlord is required on every unit to certify what's called essential maintenance practices that, that there are areas of lead paint. So, you know, certain things, window wells need to be installed. All of these basic things, they are required to submit that to the, to, um, the Department of Health. Um, if they don't do that, they can suffer a pretty significant fine. Um, so just, I just want to put that out there just so that anybody listening at home, and, you know. Yeah, thank you. Our landlord so, has to do that. So. so, well, can I ask about that? Like, um, how, yeah, who, exactly, that's my question. Who, who checks on that? Well, so what happens is you are required the landlord is required to submit that paperwork to the Department of Health every year. Um, it's a self-certification. If they come and check and you haven't done it or you haven't submitted your paperwork, then the fines begin. Do, but they're not all checked, right? No, it's sure random. Staff to check them. Right. Yeah. Uh, Jack. When we put the law in, I was just talk, we had a housing task force meeting the other night, and we talked about this you know, just for a couple of minutes. When we when we got the law passed uh, for lead paint, what we thought was that we were going to establish these uh, this requirement for EMPs, essential maintenance practices. We were going to establish liability, and then the insurance companies were going to make the landlords do it because they wouldn't want to be uh, on on uh, tap for having to pay damages. And it turns out we were just totally wrong. That they don't, they don't do anything, and for the most part, the uh, the state doesn't uh, do anything to enforce it. So I think that uh, it, it's not enforced, and I'm I'm sure that uh, we could find uh, apartments in Montpelier with deteriorated paint now, and we'd find landlords who are not conducting the essential maintenance practices. Um, Ashley, yeah, oh, oh Donna, Donna, yeah. Okay. Is there a way to do what I would say a, a, a long term, maybe two years, and do a, a total scope of the whole city, whether it's a, a vista or a, a project for some college student that we could actually get the, the city done, and then we have a baseline, and then move forward with that to see how much we feel we have to follow up. It's like an assessment. Um. I think we had talked, um, Kevin and and Bill and Sue and I, and, and you know we we kicked around some possibilities of how we could do a survey or what other way we would do to kind of get a baseline. You know, are we talking if, if we've got 1,500 units? What's our what's our problem? How big is our <coughs> pool of problems? Is it is it just 30 or 40 bad units, or is it 500 or 600 bad units? Um, and, and from, from our evaluations, we haven't been getting a lot, you know, from from the complaints. But, but people don't even know who to complain to, com or if they yeah. can, uh, without getting ramifications from it. Let alone. Yeah. So yeah, we and we didn't know, and we, we, that's why we were kind of putting this out. This was um, on your strategic plan that we were going to have this conversation and kind of see where we would go from here. Is there support to? continue doing homework on this or is there or, or is there something that we put aside and I mean do, do we have a way of knowing and having contact with renters I mean mailing lists do we sort of know which buildings they're in and then could go through the voters list to find them I'm just trying how do we get in contact with renters can, can I ask like a, a foundational question sure. maybe this is stupid what problem are we trying to solve with this are we that's, That's why I was talking about an assessment. Right. Well, we don't well, I, know. I'm curious. I just we know. are we trying to solve like inadequate housing, insufficient numbers of units, like what, or or is it the the quality of the? I I just I want to understand like what 
this ties into? Uh, Jack? I have an answer uh, uh, that I don't think that uh, people should be forced to live in uh, substandard housing. And, uh, and that's what the law of the state of Vermont is. And in a place like Montpelier with essentially a 0% vacancy rate, people don't really have a choice of where they're going to uh, live. Now, I don't think we have a basis to know whether there are a lot of people in this situation or just a few people in this situation. And I think it's worth uh, giving some thought to figuring out how we, uh, how we find that out and how, what the scope of the problem is. And so what I would suggest we do is ask the uh, city staff and the housing task force to spend some more time you know reviewing what we've done before and talking about it and uh, rather than just saying well we put it on our list last year but we're not going to bother with it other thoughts well and, and to start with where you're at but then also i guess to assess we have we know we have the older housing stock so that we also want to have renter landlords doing the investment for energy efficiency and so along those lines we don't know how old their appliances are we don't we just so much information we don't know so i just see an assessment would be helpful to us and other policies as well as immediately for the renters so just for whatever anecdotal um use this is um i I uh, actually put it to some of my students, um, knowing that this was coming up, you know, not that I'm going to base any of my decisions on based on <laughs> students tell me necessarily, but, you know, I, I, we were talking about housing and I um, said, you know, we're considering the possibility of a rental inspection program. It happened to be that this particular group of students were a lot of children of renters and they unanimously were like, you definitely need a rental inspection program. And they each had a story um, to go along with it, which I thought was fascinating actually so I'm, I'm sort of where I'm at is that um, uh, it feels like there's it's worth investigating further I'm not necessarily convinced that um, like this is uh, I think I think having an evaluation or you know to having some kind of something to um, you know just f understand sort of what the needs are and I think that actually gets to Ashley's point as well um, having a, a more holistic picture of um, what the barriers and needs are I mean to be fair this is maybe uh, something that we've been exploring right, right? but um, you know if there is well, we haven't looked at this I mean this came up as, as Mike said from from you folks last year it wasn't a staff proposal and it was to, basically the goal was to have a conversation about whether we should do this and it was just one of the last things on on the list so that's you know we're kicking this off now and obviously we've got a goal session coming up too to time to think about it but it seemed to me that certainly some ass assessment of the need is important and maybe you know we did talk about doing a community survey um, in general and I think we could put in we have some questions we could, ask, you know, we, first of all, the, the data difference between homeowners and renters, and we could ask if you're a renter, you know, have you had issues because they're, they're all anonymous, or, you know, maybe we could do some other forms of outreach to the renter community to try to give, you know, a, a anonymous survey to just get a sense of people, you know, are you generally satisfied with yep. landlords' response with the condition? Do you have life safety issues? Just, you know, like or, a, I mean, uh, this like sorry to interrupt nope. um i mean this list is is very interesting because um i mean m many of my friends are renters as well and you know as i think about some of the houses that i you know of my friends that i've i've been in i, I wonder like i don't know that they would all pass right. um yeah. even all this the stuff on the left so um yes well when used to do door-to-door -door campaigning i mean i was amazed at some of the places people live yeah. stairwells getting to them um uh, just that experience alone because i haven't been a renter in montpelier for a long time but i started out as a renter and saw many nasty places that still exist so i just feel that there is out there a lot of insufficient apartments we do also have just so people are aware we do have one other means that we check on these things um and again it's random or or not random, but it's not systematic. But our, our police and fire, when they when they do go or ambulance, when they go into apartments for other calls, if they spot something that looks odd, they do report it. So that's you know sometimes initiates a, a review. Um, but again, that's only places that happen to get those calls and not 
any kind of you know random or regular systematic with the, so yeah. there there's is one other way of us seeing an apartment without mm -hmm. necessarily being generated by our, our resident complaint sure um, Connor and and then uh, did you have to, okay uh, slightly off topic but while we're endearing ourselves to landlords tonight I <laughs> <laughs> do um, do you know of any municipalities in Vermont who have either rent control or rent stabilization programs and I, I'm not saying I support this necessarily, but I'm <laughs> interested in it with 40% of our residents being renters. Um, my understanding is that um, Burlington is the only one that I know of that has a form of rent control. Hmm. That's the only I, one. I, I'd like to learn a little more about that before the council goal session or as part of it if possible. I'm just going to um, push back on that a little bit, only in that uh, probably not as part of it. I don't want to, I mean. I, like, what I don't know could fill a book about it. It's <laughs> incredibly complicated. So if somebody from Burlington administered the program, you know, I'd like a few minutes just with the 10,000 foot view of it. It would certainly be something else that would require a charter change, because I don't mm -hmm. think it's enabled under state law. I mean, would a rental inspection program require a charter change? No, it, that's okay. the that would come that's out of right here. What's attached? The statute, right. the statute that's attached. To yes, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why, don't, why don't you Google it and let us all know? <laughs> you research. Let us know what you find. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we passed charters left and right. No. How many we can chat? <laughs> uh, so Laura Gephardt, Executive Director of the Montpelier Development Corporation. And I just wanted to add on um, to the value of taking an assessment, um, because right now we're, you're talking on anecdotes, which are important, but it's hard to have a full view of what the problem is. So I would, I would definitely encourage that, and I'd be happy on behalf of MDC to, to partner on any sort of assessment that's done. Um, and then I just want to provide you know, the other perspective from the perspective of the landlord. You know, full disclosure, I'm a renter and I've been a renter for my adult life, um, so I get that perspective. Um, but I also interact quite a bit with landlords and from the communities I worked with in Pennsylvania, there was numerous municipalities that had rental inspections. So just considering the impact that may have and even deterring people from wanting to have rental apartments, um, especially as we're considering the accessory dwelling units. Um, when we have such a low vacancy rate, how, just consider how that may, may deter people from incre adding rental units to our market. Um, so I think that's just another important nugget. I think quality of our rental units is incredibly important, but just to think about the other implications of how, you know, rental inspections, if that's what is needed, how that's rolled out, and what are the implications of that. There's a lot of layers to be considered. Uh, Jack. No city in, in Vermont has uh, rent control. Uh, Burlington. Hmm? Burlington has a uh, provision requiring a 90-day notice, which is longer than uh, other places have. We do have a uh, rent review for uh, for rents and uh, lot rents and trailer parks, it's not actually rent control, but it is a opportunity to challenge uh, rent increases. Um, and I spent years working to get that passed, but uh, no, no other rental housing is subject to rent control. And of course, you know, if you have a rental agreement that fixes the rent, it, the landlord is stuck with the rent at that during the period of the term. Um, there's uh, federally subsidized housing of various kinds, um, but no generally applicable rent, rent control. Ashley, go ahead. I was one other policy matter that I'll, I, I've, I lived in other places in Mass that, that did this. They would actually cap the percentage that your rent could increase from term to term. So if you had a year, a year lease, they were capped <laughs> at raising your rent by no more than X percentage if you renewed that lease. So if you if you wanted to stay on for a second year and the landlord was willing to have you, they couldn't raise the rent. You know, I've lived in places where it's gone from like, you know, $1,000 to like thirteen fifty in the matter of a month and nothing has changed, but it's just gonna cost you $350 more to live there. But some municipalities will cap the, the percentage increase that, that, that a landlord can charge if you renew. 
So, I think there's a significant. Um, I mean, so I think it's worth looking at, but there's a significant debate um, in the housing and economic community whether rent control is good policy because it tends to reduce investment in properties because people aren't taking the money in and it creates even higher, vac I mean, lower vacancy rates because people that have a rent control department don't leave them. And so, um, you know, I think there's definitely a pro and con. Certainly the people that are in them benefit, but. Um, to the extent that it becomes, you know, if a landlord can't afford to keep up because the rent isn't going up, then I'm not, so I think it's worth, it's, it's a, I've worked on a few economics classes on that. Yeah, it is. So um, what I feel like I'm hearing is that there is some interest in um, some level of, of looking at uh, the, either the quality of, uh, of, uh, of apartments, you know, even um, the things that uh, that are on sort of the left hand column or, or other other issues or even, um, you know, barriers that um, renters face. So um, um, I guess my one one proposal, I'm open to other suggestions if people have them, um, but I, I guess I'm coming back to Jack's suggestion about, um, you know, and, and Donna's suggestion too about uh, having some kind of an assessment uh, and or working with the housing task force because it se that seems like a natural place for or an, a group to, to collaborate um, with this and and I mean I mean it sounds to me like it's it merits further discussion at least um, so uh, I don't know if we can uh, or if we should specify any anything further than that uh, any other I ideas or thoughts or thoughts on that and that, you know, as, as far as next steps go. Yeah, oh, Lauren. Um, I mean, I would just echo a lot of what I've heard from Donna and Ashley and Jack and others um, of just, I think it's a great idea to have the um, housing task force look into it. Like, I think getting data seems like a great first step before we don't want to solve a problem that we don't have or make sure that we're mm -hmm. solving the right problems and have the right yeah. program to do it. Um, so data seems like a great step, it, but it seems like, if we're going to go through that effort, making sure that if there's other policies and things that we're thinking about, that we're getting the data at the same time, so it's not like, oh, we also want to do this energy efficiency thing, and we missed the boat on getting right. a bunch of data that we could have gotten. So just, you know, doing doing some thinking around like what what's coming down yep. the pike that we could ask the right questions of whatever data collection exercise we go through. Well, so and that makes ahead. me um, think about you know, Bill, this uh, you know the community survey that um, we're planning to do. Um, uh, so, you know, if we can keep some of that in mind. I mean, how? what's the timeline on that survey? We haven't started yet, but, okay. you know, it technically starts with, I mean, July, the July 1 budget. So right, it would right. Be wouldn't be before then. But that seems fair. I mean, it's within the scope of uh, the Questions. coming year, you yeah. know. Um, I don't know that we need any motion about that, but... Um, I, I'll take it back to the task force. Does that seem amenable to folks? Further conversation? Okay. Yes, Donna. Jack, I, I believe at one time there was a rental and landlord rights, and I believe it's a brochure I saw that the state put out. And maybe we could all educate ourselves and also make sure that that's more available. <coughs> maybe we can make a link on our website or something. There's some it's ways to be there. proactive. It's already there. Yeah, it's already there. Renter rights section yep. on the, it was actually one of your. See, I haven't, I haven't found this spot. Last year, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, year. yes. It's done, so we can send you the link. Great. Okay. All right, further discussion to be continued. Thank you so much. Thank this you. was very helpful, actually. Um, okay. I, I've actually yes, been on the, on the other side of one of these cases. I, Me too. This is a long time ago, but I, uh, I litigated a case uh, up at October Lane where the city was... Uh, condemning a unit and I was representing the tenants to try to keep them in the building but it was it's very tough to be in a position where you're where the city says we've determined that uh, the foundation is uh, unfit and the this section of the building is actually likely to collapse if we don't uh, get this vacated so the person can so the work can be done and well, the only case that we've had in my time that went to court, your, your one of your colleagues was there mm -hmm. representing the tenants for the same reasons, and it was like, you know, this is, this, you know, do you want them to live in squalor? They, but their argument was they got to live somewhere. Yep. And mm -hmm. so it was an interesting case. But. Okay. Uh, moving on then. Um, 
Uh, okay, so we have some appointments to make, and um, none of them could be here um, for the uh, uh, tree board appointments nor the Conservation Commission. Um, and so, uh, and I, with the first one, um, there were two applicants for one seat. Um, so it's very likely that we will go into. I move we go into e executive session pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A3 to consider the appointment of a public officer. I'll um, second. Um, Ashley, we do it for both? I mean, I know it's. But if we'll we take them both up at the same time. Right, but the second one only has one has applicant one, right? for yeah. two. Right, yep. Um, is that, that's a minimal. We'll do both of them in sure, executive session. Okay, um, so we will be coming out of this executive session, even though it's our last item, um, to um, vote. And, uh, oh, oh, we haven't gotten yet. Okay, so um, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we will be back shortly. Tree board and uh, Stephen Seats to the Conservation Commission. I think these are both people who are uh, uh, able to provide great service to the city. Stephen, Stephen Seats has uh, spent many years uh, in service, especially in the field of conservation. And Sean White, with her work with uh, the project manager at Friends of the Winooski River and her uh, obvious. Uh, knowledge and devotion to the subject is is going to be a great addition to the tree board second uh, was that a, was there a second that, nope. was okay that, no. okay I'm thank you thought it was a motion i was, was like i was i was with us yes i started out with okay. i moved to <laughs> okay uh further discussion uh all in favor please say aye aye opposed okay congratulations to uh stephen and sean um, all right, so uh, we have no other business, so um, we're going to move on to council reports. Um, let's start with Lauren, and we'll go around this way, if you don't mind. Or do you want to go, would you like to go last again? Um, I forgot we do this. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this. We'll give you some time. Let's, you can pass. Um, let, let's start with Donna, and we'll go this way. You can come in in the middle, <laughs> on the end. We're very flexible. Um, yes, um, as comp... Uh, Connor mentioned microtransit has been meeting and we are going to be putting out a white paper probably by the mid-April so that's going to be circulated and right now the talk is if to make GMT a <laughs> partnership in that and that we they be taking the capital shuttle the circulator route and funding and potentially Mont Montpelier Hospital Hill and put them together t to into a micro transit route that would be on an app as well as call-in, mostly app-related, so you could get a ride within 10 minutes. And so that's they're going to do some simulation with some uh, software on, on their ideas, but that's where it's moving forward. Uh, but I also I want to go back. Any questions about microtransit? You have to see me and Colin after side the meeting because we're going to get out here by 10. <laughs> well, I do have one question about this, uh, though. Is the would it be the same hours, or would it? Is oh no, no, none of that. No, I can't, hours? can't get into that kind of details okay. at all yet. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. They're just taking the resources, putting three vehicles on it, and trying okay. to work from there. So I just have one really quick question, which is, you said there's a, they, they've compiled data about commuters and parking and in. Yeah, yep, if, yep. If I could get that data, that would be really helpful because sure. that's you one know, of the things it, that was asked for. And, and it's and it's like this incredible, uh, Ken Jones has it from the state. He's the one who provided it. Perfect. So yes. Yes, I know it in the paper. I don't have the, gro uh, right. the gross well, just get data. It from Ken. You can get it from Ken. Ken Jones has it. Yeah, it's really good. And just one other thing is just that the park commission and the park staff are thrilled to have this new truck coming. <laughs> the old one not only was just having a lot of aging issues, it never quite fit their needs. And that if they had a crew, they always had to bring another vehicle, whereas the new truck is laid out to carry more people. It must be a double cab in front, mm -hmm. and that's really important because they rarely go out one at a time. So anyway, they've been talking about it at the Parks Commission and are thrilled. Thank you. All right. I, I was going to try to throw something together tonight, and John might weigh in on this, but I spoke to a couple of members of House Government Operations. 
Uh, it sounds like it was a pretty good uh, testimony today on the non-U.S. citizen voting issue. Uh, but it, the sticking point, I think, at the committee is just the sort of safety of the list there. Um, not wanting people to be necessarily identified as non-U.S. citizens and maybe opening up an exemption in the Public Records Act uh, to put that in there. But what they might want from this council at some point is a resolution or some sort of statement just saying that we would be committed to, and this would be parallel language to, the voter checklist on the state level, not handing it over to a foreign or federal entity. Mm -hmm. That's a law right now. Uh, so if we maybe have a resolution on that in the future, it could be helpful. Is that a resolution to follow the law? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he said it was a law. <laughs> well, for the, for the statewide voter checklist, it, it is a law. It, it would be a bit different than I know you're busting my chops, but. <laughs> I barely get a chance. My name's Connor. It's Connor. It's not Connor. Oh. Damn. That's a big man. Oh, that's funny. All right. And just just, just check, check in to make sure you two are done. For the moment, anyway. Um, I don't have much to talk about this week. I'm pleased that uh, the chunk of the Winooski that we're on seems to have iced out. That's great. Yeah. It was a good thing to see on Sunday night, Monday morning. Um, I went on Monday afternoon to Another Way down on Barry Street and talked with them uh, once again. Um, it's great there, and uh, that seems like a really good group of people to uh, keep in touch with, to, to um, keep in the loop on, on city matters. I'm going to keep going once a month. They have a, a Monday meeting, 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and I'll be there every last Monday of the month. Um, they uh, invited any other council members to come along, too, if you ever want to show up. Uh, it's, again, 2 to 3 Monday afternoons, and I'll be there on the last Monday. Um, and uh, that grew out of my uh, Thursday mornings at Baguitos. And I'll be back there again tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 9.30, as usual. So see you there. Thank you. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I've talked enough tonight. I'm passing, too. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I have gone to the Social and Economic Justice Committee, as I said, and there's some good progress being made on a strategic plan, I'm happy to announce, with some um, tangible next steps. So I look forward to updating you as that plays out. But um, it, was, it was a very positive meeting, and I think the idea of taking some of these policy ideas and, um, and trying to run it through and see how can this uh, committee be effective at giving a lens to all of our policies. Um, is, is exciting um, and that went to the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee as well and they're just cr cranking on all cylinders with lots and lots of projects um, but until there's one that's kind of actionable at the moment I'll spare you so um, <laughs> thanks for good meeting. Um, I, I'm gonna highlight one of those oh, okay. projects I wasn't at the last meeting it wasn't able to go so I was glad you were able to be there um, but uh, one of the things that has come up as a possibility, and I th just want to flag it for you all, is um, uh, the rec building, um, as we know, may see some changes um, sometime in the next year or two, or we'll see. But um, uh, it, that's, a, that's not connected to district heat. It's a standalone um, uh, oil burner. Um, for now, that's what's heating the building. And uh, one of the possibilities that we could look into is um, switching that heating system over to biodiesel. Um, so uh, there may be some, um, there is a possibility that we may need to change a little bit of the infrastructure to make that um, transition happen, but um, it's relatively minimal. Anyway, so just want to just put it on your radar. It's something that we may talk about or may, may come to us. Um, over the next year. So we'll see. Um, and uh, I think that is actually all the, uh, oh, actually there was another uh, one other update that I wanted to add, which is that um, the public, uh, mm, the City Hall Art Committee 
uh, is meeting tomorrow at 3.30. Um, is that, and it's meeting here? Yep. Yeah. And, uh, right, so here we'll be hallway. talking about uh, the art in this room and perhaps out in the hallway as well. And just so you know, I think the uh, general, well, actually, I, I shouldn't really, I, I don't really know uh, necessarily, but um, something that has come up is, uh, uh, wanting some color in here. And I think that seems fair. So, um, anyway, I'm just putting that out there. We're not okay. colorful enough. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> we can't all, we can't. I tried to take the advice I was given. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, the other piece of that, of the arts committee, is that the public art commission has been invited to join us, looking more at the whole building. So some of them may come. Yeah. Great. Uh, John. I have. You want to speak into your mic? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just have one thing um, also related to MIAC. Um, the chair of the committee, Ms. Stevenson, had oh, uh, advised me you. that um, there's actually a vote on the International Building Code coming up, and uh, various officials have the right to vote up to, to four votes. Uh, Montpelier would be one of them, and so she had suggested that we register the deadlines Friday so um, we had a meeting today with our staff we recommend so it can be elected officials or staff officials and we had recommended that um, it be our building inspector our fire chief is the assistant building inspector the planning director and me um, but that we asked the MIAC for advice there were some issues specific issues they have concerns on so that they flag for us but then the, the people not counting myself the other through a more knowledgeable would be able to vote on the other aspects of the code. That said, if anybody wants to take one of those seats, it's certainly, you know, we'd uh, or that, but we're gonna, we have to register by Friday. So I said I'd run it up the flagpole tonight. Um, that was our plan. I did let her know that was my plan and she didn't object to it, but um, some others here may have better information than I do, so. I'm gonna. Go. Great. I trust your judgment. Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm grateful that you'll be taking input from MIAC and others so yeah, yeah. Oh, that was there, but, and That's we fine. certainly you know we weren't even aware it was happening so thanks to them for yeah. pointing it out do we need to like move that officially you don't have to but we could i suppose i just want to make sure that there's sure why don't you move it you yeah not designate those the four of us as i second her motion are you did you move I made that? that motion okay okay <laughs> and donna has seconded it <laughs> Okay. Make sure you get the time right. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're coming up on the mayor's deadline. That's right. <laughs> so All right. Vote fast. Further, further discussion. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Okay. This should be that should that came up under other business. Yes. Well. Yes. Whatever. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Uh, great. So I think that is everything, so um, without objection, I will uh, adjourn the meeting. All right.